Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Paolo Giannozzi. I work at the University of Wood in Italy, and I'm going to, uh, to give a brief introduction on uh, density function perturbation theory, in particular with applications to, uh, to the following calculation. Uh, my talk will be a little bit uh, theoretical, uh, but anyway, you will have the possibility to. Uh, to apply to see in practice what has to be done later. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, to be, first of all, a very short reminder of what EFT is, just to, to fix what you're talking about and, uh, and the notations, and then the, the basic of density functional perturbation theory, also known as linear response theory, and what are, uh, how one can compute uh, phonons in the uh, functional perturbation theory, and uh, finally, uh, some, uh, some aspects uh, that are special, special to phonons, that is the presence in polar materials of the so-called uh, LOTO splitting, and in particular, how to deal with uh, macroscopic electric field, that is to Elective fields that are uh, homogeneous in, in a periodic, in periodic boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, density functional theory, I guess you all, all know what it is about. It transforms uh, a problem of uh, interacting electrons into an effective problem of non interacting electrons under uh, an effective potential. And, so one has to solve uh, one electron, uh, one electron, one electron um, equations known as Kohn-Sham equations, and the effective potential, the Kohn-Sham uh, potential, is a function of the charge density. And the charge density is uh, basically the sum in uh, the sum of our occupied orbitals, the square of occupied orbitals, Kohn-Sham orbitals. Uh, here, I, for, uh, in order to simplify the notation, I will assume that you are dealing with the insulators uh, and uh, with non magnetic insulators. So, uh, capital V here is uh, the, uh, the bare potential of the nuclei, so the, the, the Coulomb potential of the nuclei. Of course, the, so this works very well, and uh, as long as you have a decent um, Proclamation for the for the for the actual correlation potential for the, for the functional of the charge density, and you can write down the electronic energy, which is also a function of the charge density that contains various terms, the, the kinetic term, an external potential term, and the half way and excess correlation term. And by minimizing this electronic energy, one agree finds uh, Kohn-Sham equations for the ground state. And uh, the potential, potential contains a hard return and an excess correlation term, whose exact form is unknown, but we have the approximations for them. Now, in practice, what is done, um, in practice, one expands uh, Kohn-Sham orbitals over a suitable basis set, which for this lesson will be the plane wave basis set. And this transforms uh, the Kohn-Sham equations into nonlinear matrix eigenvalue problem. It's not the only way to solve the problem, by the way, and it's not the only basis that exists. We will see starting from tomorrow, a different basis set of localized orbitals. Anyway, if one uses the uh, same ways, uh, one has to use pseudo potential to get rid of core uh, states. And, uh, and, uh, and there is a number of uh, techniques, of numerical techniques, that are very convenient for plane waves, and that's uh, the reason why one uses plane waves and uh, in addition to some other um, <coughs> features that make it easy to check the complete the, 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 the convergence and and that's uh, 
let's say the the, ba the, the basic stuff for uh, uh, for the calculation of ground state uh, electronic structure. Now the problem we want to deal today, the problem that density function perturbation <laughs> theory deals with is um, what happens if you have an external potential that depends on some parameter. Some parameter, uh, which may be, um, for instance, an atom, typically it would be an atomic position or an external electric field, at least in this lesson, but it may be something more general. So the potential would be a function or will depend upon this bare potential of the nuclei, will, uh, will depend upon the that will depend upon the, the, um, this lambda, this parameter that I call lambda, and I can write, uh, I can assume that lambda is small and uh, write an expansion into powers of lambda. So the first order expansion will be, of course, lambda derivative of the potential respect to lambda, and so on and so forth. Now the problem is what are the corresponding expansion for the charge density. Of course, uh, the solution for P of lambda will be N of lambda, what happened. And also the energy, the DFT energy uh, functional will depend upon lambda. So we can find, we uh, can write uh, uh, similar expansions for uh, the charge density and the energy functional. And we wonder what are those. Uh, Terms here. What do we do, what do we put here in this derivative of uh, the charge density with respect to lambda, the derivative of the energy with respect to lambda, and especially second derivative of the energy with respect to lambda square. Especially because the first order uh, derivative of the energy with respect to uh, to the parameter, to the external parameter, is simple. It's known, uh, it's known from the uh, DFT equivalent of the hellman feynman theorem. The hellman feynman theory, theorem that calls for many body Hamiltonians and many body wave functions, we know that uh, the first order derivative of the energy is the expectation value of the first order explicit derivative of the Hamiltonian of the ground state. Well, the, uh, the DST equivalent, which works because uh, the, the, the energy functional is <laughs> energy functional is uh, um, minimized by the ground state uh, charge density, is that uh, the first order derivative of the energy with respect to an external parameter is given by the expectation value, again, of the, the explicit derivative of the external potential with respect to, to lambda. So there is no term uh, in the energy, in the first order term of the energy, there is no term in the first order term of the charge density. So this can be computed directly uh, given the, the ground state the electronic structure it can be computed directly. And it is, this is what we use actually to compute forces. Now in general, one can show that this is called 2n plus one theorem holds, that is the, the 2n plus one derivative of the energy, the derivative of the energy uh, order 2n plus 1 depends only on the derivative of the energy of the charge density up to order n. Again, this can be shown to be a consequence of uh, the variational character of uh, the density function of the energy function. Now, what is so the second order derivative term? The second order derivative term can be written explicitly uh, again, but you see that it contains, in addition to a relatively simple term that is the expectation value of the, of the second order derivative of the bare potential with respect to the, to the parameter, so the terms to the, to the right in the, in the first equation, 
prese tenendo il contesto deriva di modo charge density with respect to lambda and this is what is called the linear response and this is what we have to compute so this derivative of n on the charge density with respect to lambda is what we have to compute is something that we don't have uh, the ground state all this can be generalized to uh, mixed derivatives that is assuming that you have more than one parameter lambda and you can write down uh, the sec all second derivatives and they are written as mixed derivative. Anyway, you will always need uh, the derivative of the child tensor with respect to those parameters. Notice that uh, while the term from the left hand side is symmetric, is clearly symmetric, and the second term on the right hand side is also clearly symmetric. The, the one in the middle is not clearly symmetric, but it is in practice. And this dancing is symmetry is also exploited in, in quantum espresso calculations. So now we have to find out a way to compute this derivative of the child density with respect to standard potential, the linear response. There are two ways to, to do that. Uh, one way is to write explicitly the second order, the derivative of the energy at the second order as a quadratic functional of the linear response. This can be done. It's actually done and used in one of the little used codes of, of quantum espresso and minimize minimize this function. This will yield the linear response. Otherwise, one can solve a consistent procedure that uses perturbation theory and it is, uh, uh, let's say, more, has a more traditional aspect. So basically what we do is we write down the linear response of the charge density. As a function, we have to write, uh, to go through the function um, orbital. So, so, so we write down it uh, as, a, as, a functional, as a function of the, uh, the derivative of the function orbitals, this is what is written in the first equation. Then we have to write uh, the derivative of the effective potential, the effective quantum potential acting on electrons, which will depend upon uh, the derivative of the charge density or upon the linear response. And the linear term is, of course, a bare term plus uh, uh, the Hartree-like term, a term coming from the Hartree potential, which is See. In the middle on the right hand side, and the term deriving from the action correlation potential, which has to be written in terms of functional derivatives. So it looks uh, awful, but it's not that, that bad actually to compute, especially for relatively simple uh, exchange correlation functions like uh, GTA. Now, uh, we still have to figure out what is the derivative of the psi of the code some orbitals with respect to lambda. Now, this can be obtained from perturbation theory or alternatively by linearizing the consham equation. It's quite the same. Anyway, in perturbation theory, one can write down the perturbing potential, which is the first order derivative of, of the consham potential. Right, the perturbation series. Typically, uh, one, so yeah, we introduce uh, the queen function one over epsilon minus h, where h is the constant, constant, or constant, um, Hamiltonian. Uh, normally, we need sum over perturbation and uh, perturbation sum over all conduction states. So this PC is a projector of our conduction states because a change in the in balance states must come from admixture of a conduction states. You add other balance states that are full field to a balance state, uh, nothing changed, you are just uh, re uh, rotating 
you know, making uh, the, the chair is noisy. We are, we are just not rotating <coughs> the, this in you know, just making a unitary rotation in the, in the subspace of occupied state, so you have no contribution. That's why there is this project of empty states. Anyway, uh, it's not needed, however, to make uh, perturbation sums that are a problem. Uh, one can use so called Sternheimer approach, which dates back to the, the 50s or so, and instead solve a linear equation. So uh, this equation can be recast into a set of linear equations in which you obtain the linear response from the perturbed potential and a solution of a linear system. There is a self-consistency here between the, uh, the conscient, the perturbed conscient potential and the solution, the linear response uh, via the charge density. So these three equations, one, two, and three, define uh, a self-consistent procedure that can be solved and using the same technicalities that are used for the solution of conscient equations, especially for plane wave, uh, for, <coughs> for plane wave basis set. So, um, there is no sum of conduction bands, uh, so no need to compute conduction bands in particular, which are a problem for, for which might be a problem for, uh, in general, to, to compute. And uh, this machinery, this procedure works also if pseudo potential are non-local, and typically modern pseudo potential are non-local, effective potential. Um, yeah, in, in the notation here assumes uh, uh, local potential, but, uh, so V of R is written as local potential, but if, if it is non local, it's not a big deal, it's just a straightforward generalization. And another important point that will be used later is that uh, if I consider monochromatic perturbation, so, so perturbation that have uh, a given wave vector q, so that behaves, uh, behave as uh, exponential of i q dot r. Uh, uh, the linear response has the same periodicity, and there is no need to introduce supercell, which you usually would do in order to introduce to deal with uh, monochromatic perturbations with non-zero wave vector. There is no need uh, to introduce uh, supercells. Now, um, what is this useful for? Uh, it's useful to, in particular, to compute uh, the phonospectra of materials. So, just a short reminder of uh, some textbook physics. Uh, in the harmonic approximation, we uh, we expand the energy around the uh, nuclear, uh, around the equilibrium position in, uh, to second order in, uh, in nuclear in displacements. And this, uh, like this, this Hamiltonian, second order quadratic Hamiltonian, is solved exactly by transforming it into a sum of the so-called normal modes. And those normal modes are obtained uh, by uh, solving a secular equation that is written here, which you have a matrix uh, that is the force constant matrix, uh, the matrix of the interatomic force constants, um, which is second, which are second derivatives of, uh, of the energy as a function with respect to nuclear positions. And then uh, mi here, the mass, the omega squared, the frequency squared. So the uh, a textbook, uh, textbook results for mole molecules, for isolates, for, for finite systems. Um, we can, uh, it can be easily generalized to the case of periodic system. In periodic systems, you have uh, block vectors that classify your consham orbitals, and moreover, you, you have periodicity, so you have a, vector, a lattice and 
in the, in the, in the cell with uh, some given number of atoms and uh, periodicity. Uh, periodicity comes from lattices, from, from the crystals of the lattice. And uh, in that case, also normal modes, that is, that is those, uh, uh, those harmonic solu solution for the harmonic Hamiltonian are uh, classified for a block vector. <coughs> in the notes here, and typically we refer, we, we label the block vector for normal modes as a Q. And while the block vector for uh, Conscious orbitals is K, but it's just a problem of uh, distinguishes between the two. So we get uh, by diagonalizing a separately at each block vector, at each wave vector, form wave vector, we, we get uh, the form modes uh, and uh, the displacement pattern is U of Q, the displacement patterns of. Uh, um, of the phonon also, and we have to diagonalize the Fourier transform of, uh, of the force constants. Now, uh, now, how do we compute this force constant? In, force constant in a reciprocal space for a given wave vector can be uh, computed in a straightforward way using linear response techniques because we can just introduce a monochromatic perturbation, perturbation of wave vector Q, and uh, this perturbation, the linear response to this perturbation can be shown explicitly that is related, directly related to, uh, the, to, the, to the matrix of force constant in, in a reciprocal space. Now, uh, so this is what we need, this is a second order derivative of the energy with respect to monochromatic perturbations. How many of them do we need? Well, if you have, we have n atoms in a unit cell, so we have a periodically repeated unit cell containing n atoms, of course we will need, see here you have the polarization, the three Cartesian indices and an index of atoms. So in principle, you will need three times number of atoms, linear response calculations. So this tells you that quantum calculation can become increasingly uh, difficult for cells that contain more than a few, more than a few tens of uh, of atoms already a few tens of atoms if you want a complete phono calculation and it takes some time because you have to compute uh, three times the tens of atoms <laughs> different to, uh, to solve three times tens of, of atoms uh, linear linear response uh, calculations but on the other hand you don't need to to make supercell as it is done in the so-called frozen phono method in which you uh, explicitly change the position and calculate derivatives numerically. Also something that has to be noticed is that until now uh, we have used the static response, so if you look at the effect of self-consistent calculations, here we have used uh, the response to a static perturbation after the perturbation is not really static, but, but and we can consider it static because uh, it's static with respect to, to electronic frequencies. So as long as uh, a diabetic vaccination holds, so you can use uh, the electronic static uh, response because the Phonon modes are much slower, much smaller than typical uh, electronic uh, frequencies, and so uh, electrons uh, respond to much weaker than the DPI. Okay, so these are, however, gives us a single 
cross constant at the given wave function, at the given wave vector. Sorry, uh, there is noise outside. And so, um, which means that every time you need uh, to, to make a calculation at a different wave vector, you have to, to redo the calculation from the from scratch. Mm -hmm. This would not be the very convenient. Assume that you have to perform uh, an integration of a uh, wave vector or something, and you need to follow that each wave vector, and then squeeze the wave vector, what you, what do we do? It will take forever. Actually, uh, the important quantities here that allow to uh, generate uh, wave vectors and get it to generate, uh, to solve the equation at any given wave vectors are first constant in a real space. Uh, we get first constant in reciprocal space. How do can we get first constant in real space? It's not, it's not difficult, actually, as long as uh, those false constants are relatively short range. That gives uh, if you false constants are related to the force that an atom feels when another atom is moved. So uh, this force tends to decay relatively quickly, at least in non-polar materials. And so uh, the range Force constant in real space will be relatively short, which means that if you compute the uh, force constants on a, on a wave vector grid uh, that is uh, relatively and it is not necessarily very, very dense, uh, this uh, grid in, in reciprocal space uh, which corresponds to which correspond to a grid uh, in real space uh, to a supercell in real space. Uh, and as long as the supercell is big enough, is big enough to include all significant interactions of, of atoms, or so significant force constants, then by retransforming uh, what you get in real space, in the super space, you get force constant in real space. Then you can use uh, force constant in real space to generate first constant in reciprocal space. This slide far away. And something that may, uh, might, be, might be interesting and useful to know is also that um, how symmetry is used to reduce the number of linear response calculations. So we use, uh, in quantum uh, mechanics, we use the symmetry in order to compute only wave vectors, the response at wave vectors, a perturbation of a wave vector Q in the irreducible Brillouin zone. So you, you take only the irreducible segment of the Brillouin zone. What is the problem? The problem is that once you have used the symmetry to reduce the wave vectors to the irreducible Brillouin zone, you can't use it again to reduce the sum of our with key, key points of, our, uh, of the big UN zone that is contained in the, in, in the linear response calculation. So the trick here is to, uh, to find the, 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 the small group of symmetry of, of the wave vector Q, that is the, group, uh, the symmetry group of the subgroup of uh, symmetry operation that leave the, the wave vector Q unchanged and symmetrize uh, using that, uh, symmetrize uh, the sum of our brain and zone uh, of our K points uh, uh, using that, the small group of work, which implies uh, since uh, the symmetry operation will only mix uh, irreducible representations uh, inside the given irreducible representation which implies to figure out what are the irreducible representations of a small group and, uh, and then symmetrize inside each irreducible representation. Irreducible representations are small, typically one, two, three, four, maximum. So it's, uh, it's relatively, it's quite convenient. 
how much does it cost? Well, let's say that each uh, linear resource calculation costs uh, a little bit more than a corresponding ground state calculation. How much? Uh, how much more? It depends upon several hard to predict uh, factors, in particular the symmetry. And so a few times, let's say the order of magnitude is the same, but there might be a prefactor of uh, a few times, uh, up to a few times, the, the cost of a circumcision calculation. Consider that you have to do three times n such uh, calculations. So, uh, so it will take, uh, anyway, some time. And that's uh, what one finds uh, for simple crystals or even more complex crystals. I'm always showing uh, those because even if they are a little bit oldish, but anyway, Phonon calculations always uh, always look the same, so they you know, just an example. Now, uh, these uh, silicon germanium, of course, are a simple case. Uh, you see here uh, at the gamma point, you have zero frequencies, uh, zero frequency mode, acoustic mode. Gamma means the Q equals zero, so here you have translational invariance, uh, and so you have zero. Uh, Frequencies, three zero frequencies, and here you have three, um, three degenerate frequencies, which unfortunately are not degenerate if the if the semiconductor is polar. So if you go from silicon to gallium arsenide, for instance, which is polar, so it has some charge that is present on each atom. What happens is that in the in the limit of a vanishing wave vector. You observe a splitting between, in particular in this case, uh, between two modes uh, in which uh, the pattern of displacement is also orthogonal to the direction of the wave, the wave vector, so trans two transverse modes and uh, a longitudinal mode that has a uh, higher frequency. Now, this comes from, uh, from the Long ranges of uh, Coulomb interaction and the long ranges of Coulomb interaction have the consequence of uh, uh, generating, uh, may generate a microscopic electric field, so a uniform electric field everywhere in the, it is everywhere in uniform on the crystal. And is possibly responsible for this NOT of splitting. It's, uh, it's a well known phenomenon. Uh, what makes it hard to treat in a crystal is that this uniform electric field is something that is not uh, compatible with periodic boundary, boundary conditions because the potential uh, that generates a uniform. Boundary condition, a uniform uh, electric field is incompatible with periodic boundary conditions. Now, the problem, uh, can, problem is known since many years, and the uh, solution is also known, that can be also found in uh, all the textbook like the Bon Wang uh, text. Uh, in which uh, what one has to do is to look at this long wavelength limit, so this q equals zero, q tending to zero, not q equals zero, q tending to zero limit, and, and see what happens. Uh, one can write uh, phenomenological energy expression for the energy in which uh, one has uh, atomic displacements and Microscopic electric field. So, the microscopic electric field must be added separately. It cannot, it cannot uh, appear uh, spontaneously uh, in periodic conditions in crystals. So, uh, this is uh, how it looks like. So, there is a quadratic term that depends upon the matrix of force constant and or upon. Uh, this atomic displacement, another uh, atomic and term that is very electrostatic, so have some infinity is the electronic response to an electric field. And there is a, a mixed term which contains a so-called Born effective charge tensor, 
which couples electric fields and and atomic displacement. So by by working with uh, with uh, electrostatics uh, a little bit, uh, one can find and by minimizing by finding by looking for the electric field that minimizes the such a uh, such a phenomenological expression of the energy, one finds uh, that that can be an electric field along uh, the direction of the wave vector, so in the in longitudinal electric field. And the value of this electric field is written yeah, in this form. You see that it's uh, directed along uh, the wave vector Q. And the corresponding minimized uh, quadratic uh, function has a uh, function quadratic field in, in the atomic displacement has uh, force constant that you compute, uh, the, the so-called analytical part of the force constant is what you get from the calculation, plus a non-analytic term, which in fact depends upon the direction of approach to Q equals zero, that, that depends upon the, the, uh, the force constant. Then the uh, effective charges, both effective charges and the electric tensor. At this point, we need to find what uh, these electric effective charges and the electric tensor. One can find that those, uh, both of those objects are actually a second derivative of the energy and a second derivative of the energy. So they can be computed uh, using linear response as long as uh, uh, as long as one finds uh, a way to deal with macroscopic electric fields, because uh, uh, those second derivatives are perfectly well defined, but we have to find uh, a way to, to deal with a macroscopic electric field. It's not consistent with uh, periodic practice, completes with a periodic uh, boundary condition. Now, uh, in linear, in general, uh, this is a problem that can be dealt with uh, in the so-called the modern theory of polarizability, or periphase, using the so-called periphase. In the specific case of linear response, one can, however, uh, resort to a trick uh, because the, here the problem, what is, is this, uh, is the operator R. The operator R is, uh, not going to define the lattice periodic framework, but uh, what we need in practice are only matrix elements of R between occupied and empty states. Matrix elements on, on occupied states are not on the same states are not well defined, but matrix elements on different uh, states, uh, one occupied and one not, uh, can be written in a well-defined form by uh, a trick, uh, by, uh, by using, uh, oops, by using, uh, by introducing an, a, um, an identity, an identity in which uh, R is replaced by, uh, the commutator of R with uh, the Consham Hamiltonian, and, and there is a, a term which is also which is all the, which has also the, 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 the appearance of a, of a green function one over H minus epsilon p, and uh, and what is what is about uh, um, this formula, so the matrix element of the commutator is well defined, so one can compute quite easily the commutator, and what uh, turns out is that the matrix element is well defined, even in a periodic system, and so one can solve, uh, one can find uh, the known term of, uh, of the linear system that you have to solve uh, with, 
in, uh, in the linear in the FPT uh, equations, I will, you can write uh, this linear term, uh, this known term, uh, using another linear system, and resolving another linear system, which on the right hand side, uh, there is the commutator of, of R with the Conchian orbital. And uh, this trick can be used again to, to, to compute uh, the, the second order derivatives. Uh, so in particular, the polarization uh, induced by an atomic displacement wouldn't be a well-defined object because the polarization in a periodic system in the integral of r times n of r is not well-defined. Uh, but uh, what we need here exactly well defined. So uh, in the end, one can write uh, uh, effective charges as, uh, using the linear response to an atomic perturbation and the suitable, uh, making a suitable uh, operation, suitable dot product with uh, the, the derivative with respect to, to an electric field, or vice versa. That's why in the quantum espresso you will find the possibility to, to, to compute the uh, effective charges in two different ways. And uh, with the same machinery, one can, one can find uh, the, the dielectric tensor, the electronic part of the dielectric tensor. And so uh, once we have uh, uh, so in the end, what we need is three additional calculations, three additional linear response calculations to an experimental electric field. That's what we need in order to compute effective charges and the electric tensors. And so at this time, so we have and this time we have the possibility to uh, what do we do at this point? We sub effective charges. Uh, have are long range in, in case of uh, when there is a non-analytic non term, you can you can just do uh, an inverse Fourier transform. You will get uh, a big mess because uh, there are actually non-analytic long range uh, terms, uh, so you can just seem to do this a simple Fourier transform of of a charge of a false constant computed on a, a grid of a simple space grid, but you can remove out, subtract out a term that uh, has the, the, the same form, the same Q equals zero limit of the non analytic term. This will make false constant short range, make the free transform, and then when you need the, the charge times the, the, the false constant in real circular space at uh, generic u, you have to add back what you what you need. Yeah, you see the original optical splitting. There are many other things that you can compute uh, directly or indirectly like the the infrared intensity can are a direct uh, byproduct of effective charges and phonon displacement. It's a little bit more difficult to compute the non rational Raman intensity that are third order derivatives of the energy, but there are ways to compute that. And then you can do, in particular, once you have the possibility to compute phonons at any any wave vector, then you can, for instance, compute uh, the vibration of free energy using the quasi harmonic approximation. And you can, and another byproduct that is very important is uh, electron phonon interaction coefficients because all electron phonon related quantities are, uh, are obtained, obtainable by the, the response to 
a form, self-consistent response to a form, and matrix elements of this quantity. And it is something that is a byproduct of the linear response and can be delayed not, not so easily, but anyway, what we need to put all kind of electron form and calculation. Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going too long, so I'm Okay, so good morning everyone again. My name is Yuri Timrov. I'm from Laboratory for Material Simulations at Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. So this is actually, you can see the institute here on the background. Uh, and I will continue with the lecture of uh, uh, intro introduction to time-dependent density functional perturbation theory. So let's talk about uh, computational spectroscopy from ground state to excited state. So Paolo reminded you in his lecture about DFT, which is the theory for ground state, which can give you the band structure like this one, let's say for silicon. But when we talk about uh, excited states, what we're doing, we are actually irradiating the material, uh, for example, by photons. And we excite electrons from valence bands to conduction bands. So these excitations are marked by these red dashed uh, arrows. And there is a band gap in this case between valence band and conduction bands. So DFT is the theory for ground states, which gives us wave functions and energies. And what we can do in the simplest case is just simply use so-called independent particle approximation, where we just use DFT uh, information, which is the energies. And in independent particle approximation, we simply consider independent excitations of electrons. But this is very simplistic approach and often is not uh, sufficient or not good enough to compare those experiments. So we need to do uh, more accurate. We need to use some more accurate approach. And that's why uh, we will discuss about extension of DFT to the time domain. And that's the name comes from there, time dependent DFT. So this is the outline of uh, the talk. So we will start first with the basics of TDDFT. We will consider briefly the two runge gross theorems. Then we will discuss about linear response TDDFT. Uh, in particular, I will review briefly three ways how to solve linear response TDDFT equations, such as Dyson method, Steinheimer method, and Louis Langsus approach. And finally, we will discuss about applications to two spectroscopies, which are electron energy loss and inelastic neutron scattering. So let's start with the basics. Uh, so now we're talking about time dependent Schrodinger equation. It is similar to the static Schrodinger equation, but here now we introduce also time variable in the equation. So the equation is written here at the top, where on the left we have the change of the uh, electronic wave function over time. So the partial time derivative on the left, and on the right we have action of the Hamiltonian of the system on the wave function. Notice that these quantities, wave function and Hamiltonian, depend not only on positions of electrons, Ri, but also now they depend on time, T. And the Hamiltonian is defined on the second line where you have usual kinetic term. We have uh, electron-electron interactions, second term, and third one is the external potential, which is also time dependent. And by analogy to the static case, instead of working with the uh, wave function, which is very complicated uh, object, which depends on three n plus one variables, so three n special variables plus one, which is time. So it's complicated object. So instead of working with psi, we work with the charge density n which is a much simpler object. It's a function of only, only four variables, three special coordinates, x, y, z, or r, and the fourth one is time. And this object is obtained by integrating the square modulus of the wave function over all coordinates from r2 to rn, except one, which is r. So now our object n depends on r and t. And this is really the main quantity in DFT. Can we use the same approach as in DFT? 
The answer is no. So why is it so? So let's re remind to ourselves that in DFT, there is one-to-one -one mapping between the static charge density and the static external potential. And we use the minimization principle of the total energy. In TDDFT instead, we cannot straightforwardly extend the same idea to the time domain because the total energy is no longer a conserved quantity. So we cannot use the minimization principle of the total energy because it's not conserved. So we need to do something else. And this is where runge gross theorems come. There are two theorems. So this theorem state the following. Let's just read it up loud. For any system of interacting particles in an external time-dependent potential V of RT, which can be expanded in Taylor series with respect to time, and given an initial state, psi naught, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the external potential and the time-dependent density N, apart from a trivial function of time. So there is still a one-to-one -one mapping between external potential and the density, which are both time-dependent. However, now there is a second theorem that introduces a quantum mechanical action functional A. So this function, function sorry, action functional A is defined as integral from time T0 to T1, uh, over, so integral over time of this matrix element, psi T, psi T, and we have this matrix element, IH bar D over DT minus Hamiltonian. So we want to uh, find a stationary point for this quantum mechanical action functional at uh, the time density N0. So basically we take a variation of this function with respect to the density, and then this is, will be zero for the true time dependent density N0. So basically we are want to extremize this action functional, which would give us the the true ground state density. So again, now we have uh, non-interacting particles, but now the, the system is time dependent. And the density of this fictitious system, N0, corresponds to the system, to the density of the true system, which is interacting and also evolving in time. So basically we get this true density by extremizing this action functional, instead of minimization of the total energy like in EFT. So that's the two theorems. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about this action functional. So it's written here on the first line on the slide. There are several contributions. So kinetic term, second one is Hartree, third one exchange correlation, and the last one, the integrals of the external potential and density. So Hartree potential has familiar form written here, but now we just have also integration over time from T0 to T1. But while the special integral has the similar form like in a static case, but now there is just time in the density. And we can obtain uh, or introduce time-dependent quotient equations written here in the blue uh, rectangle. Now on the left, we have the time variation of the wave function. And on the right, we have action of the Hamiltonian on the wave function. So there is kinetic energy minus h bar squared divided by 2m0, gradient squared, plus the time-dependent quantum potential. And this time-dependent quantum potential defined at the bottom, there is Hartree term, exchange correlation external, and which are written this form. So it looks very, very similar to the static case, but now we have time dependence. And on the right, we have expression for the charge density, which is again, looks very similar to the static case, but now we have time. So now uh, we can take TDDFT and linearize TDDFT equations. This would give us linear response to TDDFT. So what does this mean? We uh, assume that the external potential is weak. So we can write the external potential as static component, like in st static DFT, V external zero of R, which does not depend on time. Plus we're adding some infinitesimal uh, small perturbing potential V prime external, which depends on time. So here we make an assumption that the perturbation is time dependent and very weak. So this allows us to uh, introduce linear response to DDFT. 
so we just expand charge density in Taylor series. So zero order term in zero, first order term and prime, second order and double prime, etc. So since we're interested in linear response, that is to say only to first order, so we neglect second order and higher order terms. So we just keep N0 and N prime. And then we can uh, uh, make a connection between this uh, first order variation of the density N prime and the external potential V prime. So the connection between N prime and V prime is via this integral equation. And here we introduce chi, which is the so-called susceptibility of the system. This is really the main uh, object of interest that we want to compute. Chi depends on two special coordinates, RR prime, and the difference in time, time minus T minus T prime. So our main goal is really compute the susceptibility of the system chi. And so this is where the terminology comes from, time dependent density function of perturbation theory. So TDDF PT, because here we use the perturbation theory. Uh, and we limit ourselves only to first order. So also people use the term linear response TDDFT. So TDDFPT is less commonly used, but it's essentially the time-dependent extension of what Professor Janot introduced in the first lecture for phonons, but we just adapted to the electronic excitation. So it's perturbation theory, but extended to time domain. Now, uh, there are three ways how to solve these equations. Um, there are others, but I would like to focus on these ones. Uh, so these are Dyson equation or Dyson method, Steinheimer method, and Louisville Lanzos method. So let me review briefly the, these three methods just to give you some uh, overview so you, you are familiar with these different techniques that are used in the community. Let's start with Dyson method. It's really historically first method that was introduced and still very widely used in the community in different codes like Yambo, but also many other codes. So here the main idea is to solve so-called Dyson-like matrix equation in this blue rectangle. Uh, so this equation is written for the susceptibility chi. Now it's written as a matrix of G, G prime, which where G and G prime are reciprocal lattice vectors. And this object depends on Q and omega. So omega is the frequency and Q is the momentum. And this object chi can be obtained by solving this equation. So in this equation on the right hand side, we have chi naught, which is the uh, non-interacting susceptibility plus sum over G1, G2, again, of this non-interacting chi naught. Uh, in here we have the kernel, it's so it's so called the kernel of the equation, where V is the uh, Fourier transform of the Coulomb potential, it has quite simple form, uh, 1 over Q plus G squared, with the prefactor 4 pi E squared. And then we have the so called exchange correlation kernel F XC. And then we have chi. So essentially, the unknown object chi appears on the left of the equation and on the right of the equation. So to solve this equation, uh, we need to use a self-consistent approach in order to obtain the quantity of interest chi. So chi naught in, in yellow has this simple form, sum over k points, sum over n and prime, where n is the occupied states and prime empty states. So essentially, we are considering all possible excitation from all occupied states to all empty states. So this can be quite computationally expensive if we have many, many conduction states or empty states. So one has to converge these quantities in, with respect to the summation. And then we have F and K minus F and prime K plus Q, which are occupations, can be Fermi Dirac or something else. Then we have the dominator. So H bar omega, the energy of the photon then epsilon nk minus epsilon n prime k plus q, which are simply concham energies at point k and k plus q, and i eta, which is the infinitesimal number, which is added to uh, regularize this equation because the, the denominator can be zero when the frequency of the photon equals the energy of the transition, 
So we don't want to have division by zero. So we're adding some uh, uh, Laurentian or Gaussian smearing with this I eta. And then we have matrix elements between ground state conchamere functions, phi naught, and exponentials. So there are a few uh, disadvantages in this approach. First of all, there is summation over numerous empty states and prime. So this object can be computationally quite expensive to compute. Then we have multiplications and inversion of large matrices. So we need to solve this matrix equation can be, uh, the size of these matrices can be um, uh, 500 by 500, less or more, quite large matrices. Then we have multiplication, then we have inversions, it's quite expensive. And moreover, we need to solve this equation for every value of frequency omega. So we need to do it many, many times for each frequency. That's again quite expensive computation. Even though this method is very popular, but it's quite expensive computation, even though there are different techniques how to speed up these calculations. So that was the first approach. Now let's talk about the second approach, which is also used in different groups, but maybe less frequently than Dyson method. The idea is uh, quite simple. We start with the time-dependent Conchem equation. And I just recall that the Hamiltonian, Conchem Hamiltonian written in this form, we have kinetic energy, external potential that depends on time, and exchange correlation potential that depends on time. The external potential, as we already discussed earlier, can be written in this form. The static potential plus infinitesimal time-dependent potential, V prime, we also discussed that we can represent the charge density in a similar way, where we have N0, the, uh, the uh, time independent quantity plus the response density that depends on time. And similarly, we can represent the Hartree and exchange correlation potential in the same form as the uh, time independent component plus uh, linear response of the Hartree and exchange correlation potential. So we can write, write this uh, more uh, compact form. So H uh, Conchem Hamiltonian is a sum of two components, the blue one, which is the, the same like in gra ground state DFT, so in static DFT, and the uh, orange one, V prime, which are all uh, first order components. So the perturbing potential V prime external, but also the response heart ring change correlation potential. And then for convenience, we can define the time-dependent consumer equation phi in this form, the exponential plus time-independent wave function plus the response wave function. And then we end up with the uh, system of time-dependent linear response consumer equation that are known as Steinheimer equations. These are the same Steinheimer equations that we saw in the lecture of. Professor Gianozzi, but that was static case. So there was no time or time zero. Well, in this case, we write these Tenheimer equations in the time domain. And we have two equations. The first one is the resonant. Second one is anti-resonant. So the first one is written for the uh, response wave function phi prime, while the second one for the response function phi prime co complex conjugated. So we need to solve these two equations simultaneously. Uh, and so on the left, we have time derivatives. On the right, we have uh, several components. So in particular, H naught minus epsilon, so which is the um, perturbed Hamiltonian minus eigenvalue times the response wave functions phi prime and phi prime star, and plus the response potentials, V external prime plus V heart exchange correlation prime acting on ground state constant orbitals phi naught and phi naught start. So we don't solve these equations in the time domain, even though we can do that. Uh, so we actually do the Fourier transform to the frequency domain. So instead of time, we have frequency omega. So this is done for convenience. And, and this is the form of our uh, Steinheimer equations. Now we don't have time, but we have frequency. Uh, we can also recognize here 
the objects that we saw in the first lecture, quite similar, but also there are some differences. In particular, the green objects are the Hartwig Schicht correlation response potential, that it has this form, the integral of the Coulomb potential plus exchange correlation kernel times the response density. So this object uh, in magenta is the response charge density, which in the linearized form has uh, is defined in sum of two components, phi prime of omega phi naught star plus phi prime complex conjugated of minus omega and phi, 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 phi naught. So this equation all can be derived simply using perturbation theory to first order and then Fourier transforming them. It's really straightforward. I'm just showing the final results that can be a bit complicated and difficult to, to follow. But this is just, an, let's say, to give you an idea of what are the equations. And the quantity of interest are in yellow. These are the response wave functions. So you can see that we want to solve these equations in the blue rectangle. So we want to find these yellow objects. But to solve this equation, we need to know these yellow objects because we need to use this phi star, sorry, phi prime and phi prime complex conjugated to obtain density and prime in magenta that is used to compute the potential in green. So you see, it's a closed loop. So that's why we need to solve this equation so consistently, iteratively. And also, you can recognize here another object in blue. PC, which is the, the projector on empty states. And we can rewrite it as one minus projector on occupied states. So this is exactly the same what Professor Gianotti introduced in the first lecture. So this projector PC in the equations is very useful because it allows us to avoid having summations over numerous empty states. So we really simplify, we reduce the computational cost significantly. Mm. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages in this approach? So the positive point is that there is no need in empty states, thanks to the project on empty states, like in the case of phonons. But there is still uh, some bottleneck. And this is the fact that we need to solve these equations for each value of frequency. You can see in these equations, we have frequency, so we need to solve them for each value of frequency. It's like in phonon, but in phonon you do it just once because there is no frequency or it's static. Well, in this case, we need to do it many times for every frequency, which is even more complicated. So that was the Steinheimer method. And the third method is the louisville langsus method. So this is a most recent uh, approach that was introduced and it is, uh, uh, less widely used in the community, but it's it's very powerful. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So the math is quite involved, but again, this is just to give you a taste of, of the method. You don't need to understand each of these components. You can come back later if you're interested, but this is really just to give you some idea of, of this. So in this in reveal Langsus method, we start with the so-called quantum reveal equation that describes the time evolution of the charge density matrix rho. So on the left, we have the time derivative of the rho, rho uh, so which is the density matrix operator, rho of t. And on the right-hand side, we have the commutator of the con <laughs> con 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 Sorry, could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. And on the right, we have the uh, commutator of the Consham Hamiltonian in this same object the charge density matrix operator. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Let me go a bit quicker. So this object rho in the coordinate representation has this form. And then we can use the linearization of this equation, that is to say perturbation theory to first order. And then we can do Fourier transform from time domain to the frequency domain, like we did in the case of Steinheimer method. And then we can write our final equation in this uh, red uh, rectangle. So our equation is the first one, where L is the new object that we introduced. It's called uh, Liouvillian superoperator. It's defined on the second line. 
And then formally, we can write the solution of this equation, rho prime of omega, by simply putting this object in, in brackets on the right with the minus one sign. It's really a formal uh, expression. But once we know rho prime, we can compute the susceptibility chi as the trace of the one body operator A and rho prime. And to solve these equations in practice, we use the Lanczos algorithm. It's very uh, efficient uh, algorithm. So before we use this approach, we use the standard batch representation. So we sort of change the variables by using 45 degree rotation. So we go from two variables, phi prime and phi prime complex conjugated to home minus omega. So we take the half sum and half difference and we define new variables, Q and P. So this rotation is convenient because it allows, allows us to simplify equations and, and reduce the computational cost. And so by using this start bunch representation, we can rewrite quantum Liouville equation on the left in a matrix form in this blue rectangle. And this matrix equation can be solved using Lanczos algorithm. So, sorry, before I discuss the Lanczos algorithm, in this matrix equation, in yellow is the D operator, which is the non-interacting one, because it depends on ground state objects like H0 and Epsilon, while magenta K operator is more complicated object because it contains all the interactions. So you see there is the integral of the Coulomb and exchange correlation kernel and all these wave functions. So D is the non-interacting operator and K is the interacting one. So one can neglect K and see what would be independent particle approximation. But in general, we need to include interaction term K. And so as I said, we can solve this equation using the Lanczos algorithm. So we define these vectors V and U. And then I, again, I drop all the details, but with the Lanczos recursion chain is written here. There are two uh, coupled equations. And we solve these equations iteratively and recursively. So we need to generate these coefficients beta and gamma, and we obtain the three diagonal matrix T. So it's very scarce matrix. Many elements are zero. There is just on the next diagonal elements, beta and gamma, which are not, not zero. It's very nice to have this scarce matrix because uh, we can use different linear algebra uh, libraries or techniques to, to, to deal with it later on in the post-processing step. So once we know this matrix T, we can compute the final quantity of interest, chi, which is the susceptibility written in this form. So we take this matrix T in yellow, uh, we take H bar omega times the identity matrix. So we take the difference and we take it to the power of minus one. Then we multiply by E1N, which is the just unit vector and dimensional. And on the left, we have zeta, which are other objects that are computed on the fly. They're quite complicated. They are defined here, but they are really inexpensive to compute on the fly. And this is the post-processing step to compute this chi. So let me summarize the Lanczos method. What are the strengths and weaknesses? So the strengths, are that there is no need in empty states, the same uh, positive point like in Steinheimer method, because we use the projector on empty states. Then the three diagonal matrix must be computed only once, independently of frequency. So essentially, when we solve this uh, Lanczos, uh, we use the Lanczos algorithm to solve this matrix equation in blue, there is frequency. But in practice, we don't use frequency. We just propagate these equations independently of frequency. So we do it just only once. We don't do it every time for each frequency. We do it only once. It's really the bottleneck of the calculation to obtain these three diagonal matrix. But once we have it, then we do a post-processing step to compute chi, which is very inexpensive. It takes just a few seconds in the laptop. And this we do for different values of frequency. So these are all positive points, but are the weaknesses? And one weakness that I can highlight immediately is that 
UV lung cytometer gives you immediately the full spectrum, but it cannot tell you the origin of different individual peaks in the spectrum. So sometimes people use different methods together, like UV lung cells, but also you can use maybe Steinheimer or David or, or Dyson, sorry, to if you want to discuss the origin of the peaks. Okay, that, that was the overview of three methods. Uh, I'm running a bit late. Let me spend just a couple of minutes to discuss the applications, uh, electron energy loss and inelastic neutron scattering. So let me drop the math. I think we had a lot of math already. So just let me show you. Uh, so there is a code in quantum espresso turbo eels that allows to compute electron energy loss spectra of solids. Uh, so this is how the convergence of the spectra look like. On the left, we have the minus imaginary part of epsilon minus one, which is the inverse electric uh, function. as a function of frequency. You see, when you do thousand lung cell iterations, you obtain very noisy spectrum, many wiggles. Then when you increase the number of lung cell iterations, so you increase the size of the three diagonal matrix T, to 2000, you see that spectrum becomes much smoother. And when you go to 5000, it's already very smooth. But we can also use extrapolation techniques. I think uh, in the hands-on, you will learn more about this. So extrapolation techniques allow you to really reduce significantly the computational cost. You can just do 1000 iterations and extrapolate lines of coefficients. So you will hear in the hands-on what is this. But you can see again, instead of doing 5,000 iterations, you can do just 1,000 and extrapolate, and you obtain the same final spectrum in black. And on the right, we see the convergence of the spectrum with respect to the key points. As usual, we need to converse spectrum as any other quantity of interest. And this is how it looks like for key points convergence. We go from the grid 666, quite many unphysical. Uh, features in the spectrum, but when you go to dense enough K mesh, 14, 14, 14, you see the final converged spectrum where all these wiggles are physical. And this is the final prop, uh, the final spectrum on the left, the one for silicon, oh, sorry, it's for diamond, apologies. So you see the experiments are these black dots, and in red is the theory using the Lanxus approach, LL, and blue dashed. Again, it's another, it's also theory, but using conventional TDDFT. By conventional, I mean it's actually Dyson method, which is more traditionally used. But you see that the two theoretical methods, they really on top of each other almost. And moreover, both of them agree very nicely with experiments. There are still some variations, but overall it looks very nice. And on the right, you see how the spectrum changes as a function of Q, the transfer momentum from 0.1. 1.7 astronom to the minus one. You see that it really changes a lot as a function of Q. Uh, also some other examples for silicon, aluminum, again, very nice agreement between theory and experiment. And also more advanced systems like bismuth, including spinner decoupling. We see again that the overall shape is very nicely predicted by theory. And you can see on the right how the spectrum changes with the is a function of the transfer momentum Q. And another example is the inelastic neutron scattering, where instead of scattering of electrons, you have scattering of neutrons. And this allows us to study other spectroscopy, which are uh, magnetic excitations using this code, Turbo Magnum, which is also part of Quantum Express. In an example of chromium triodide, uh, we can compute this spectra shown here on the left the three by three block for the real part of the susceptibility chi, and on the right is the three by three block on the imaginary part of chi. So here we have three by three blocks because we have uh, X, Y, Z components. We have external magnetic field, so it has three components, X, Y, Z, and then we compute the responses again along X, Y, Z. So it's three by three matrix, and these are the individual components. But then, generally, to study magnons, we just need transverse components. And recently, uh, we also extended uh, the turbo magnon code from, uh, from non-remission to pseudo-remission Lanxus algorithm that allows us to say factor of two in the computational cost. You see, th these are just two different 
verge flavors of the Langfest algorithm. The, uh, historically, we had just uh, non emission one, which was computationally expensive, but in this orange dashed spectra. But luckily, now we have a new flavor, which is two times faster in blue, and spectra are exactly the same. So we really, really recommend to use pseudo emission approach by default. And this is how the magnon spectrum of chromium triodide monolayer look like. On the left, we see magnon energy, H omega, along uh, high symmetry direction for the magnon vector cube. You see that the blue spectrum has this uh, shape. And interestingly, when Q goes to zero, it it's goes to zero, uh, as it should be. Because in the absence of spinobi coupling, Magnon energy must be zero. But instead, when you switch off spin and coupling, the spectrum becomes red and it's shifted. You see at the gamma, there is a finite gap. It's called Goldstone, Goldstone gap. And overall, the shape is quite similar, but especially at gamma, there is a gap. And on the right, you see how the spectrum convergence for Q uh, close to gamma is a function of number of lumps of saturation. You can see, you see that you need to go up to 10,000 iterations or slightly more to converge very accurately the position of the magnon peak. And I think final example, uh, magnon dispersion in chromium triodide bulk and monolayer. So this is the kind of this, um, color map magnon dispersion that you can obtain using quantum espresso, turbo magnon code. You see that how the magnon energy changes is a function of Q along high symmetry directions in bulk and monolayer, and what are the differences. In particular, we studied uh, magnum gap at the K point, and this gap originates due to spinner decoupling and interlayer interactions in the bulk. So if you want to learn more, you can study these two papers shown here. And also, we studied more prototypical systems like bulk iron and bulk nickel. Again, these are the magnon dispersions. You see that our, uh, the predictions using turbo magnon code of quantum espresso, this work, uh, these orange dots agree very nicely with previous calculations. These uh, colored dots using either Steinheimer or, or Dyson approach, but also they agree with experiments, this empty rhombi. So on the left for our bulk iron, very nice agreement with experiments. While on the right, for the bulk nickel experiments are factor of two underestimated, or actually theory overestimates by factor of two because of the uh, LDA functional. Because all these calculations are based on local density approximation, actually adiabatic local density approximation, which is not good enough for such, some systems like bulk nickel, and you need to do more advanced use more advanced functionals. For example, LDA plus U, or maybe some more advanced functionals. But this is really going beyond the topic of this lecture. And this is the summary of this lecture. Uh, sorry for being late. Uh, I think we can stop here, maybe answer questions, or go co for a coffee break. Thank you. OK, yeah. so welcome back, everyone. So I'll be with you just for a few minutes to make an introduction to the hands-on. So now we will continue with the hands-on for the next couple hours or so. There are two parts. So the first part will be about hands-on on phonons for HPC using GPUs. So this will be done uh, with my brief introduction, but then it will be mainly Laura Valentani who will uh, guide you through the hands-on and who prepared all this uh, presentation and material. And then in the second half, there will be hands-on on TDDFT by Tommaso Gorni and Oscar Baseggio. So yes, I think we can get started. So let's start with the first part, which is hands-on on phonon. So I just would like to spend a few minutes to uh, recap on what you learned this morning with Professor Giannotti on, on phonons. So very briefly, as you learned, we want to compute interatomic force constants that are needed to compute phonon dispersions. So let me introduce a few quantities here. So let us consider K 
capital N A T number of atoms in the unit cell. Uh, alpha would mean uh, Cartesian components X Y Z. Capital R is the point uh, in the Bradley lattice and define the position of uh, a unit cell. And capital N R is the number of this kind of unit cells. And then with the U as alpha capital R, we will denote uh, atomic displacement. So this would correspond to the displacement of atom S in the unit cell uh, along the uh, alpha direction. This could be X, Y, Z. So we have, have we can have three multiplied N, A, T number of displacements. So we have N, A, T number of atoms, and each of the atoms can move in three directions. So that's why we have three, three times N, A, T. And then we want to compute the matrix of interatomics for constants, capital C of S alpha, S prime beta of R, R prime. So actually this object depends on only on the difference between capital R and capital R prime. And by definition, this is the second derivative of the total energy with respect to the displacement. This is what you saw in the, in the lecture in the morning. So now we want to compute this object. And then also you saw the secular equation. So this is the, this first equation written here, um, where omega are normal mode frequencies and u tilde eigenvectors of phonons. So we want to solve this secular equation. And d tilde is the uh, so-called dynamical matrix. And this object is simply the Fourier transform of the interatomic force constant. So this object in a red rectangle is the interatomic force constants, the object in, in a real space, R, R prime. So then we just do Fourier transform. So we take this object, we sum over capital R, capital R prime with this phase factor, exponential IQ, R prime minus R, R, sorry. And then we also add this normalization factor, one divided by square root MS, MS prime. So these are the masses of atoms. So in the calculation of phonons, you need to specify also the atomic mass. If you do it in the wrong way, you will get wrong <laughs> results. So it's actually very important to specify atomic mass correctly. You, you will learn uh, how to do it, but you can either do it in the ACF input or the, in the phonon input. So, and then by diagonal, diagonalizing the dynamical matrix, we can obtain eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So eigenvalues would be the phonon frequencies, squared actually, and eigenvectors would be phonon displacements. So we need to know phonon frequency. So we need to diagonalize this dynamical matrix. And also this morning you saw the Steinheimer equation, static for the phonons, and in DDFT we discussed for the frequency dependent, but now we're talking about phonons, so it is static. So again, here we remind you how this equation looks like, quite complicated, quite many notations and indices. So on the left, we have the Hamiltonian HSCF, self-consistent field at point K plus Q. So, and also in this slide, we show you the names of the Fortran routines in quantum espresso that implement these objects. So this will be needed later during the hands-on because Laura will show you how to run phonon code on the GPUs. So she will refer to this kind of routines just to tell you how much time is spent in different parts of the code. So H, H underscore Psi is the routine that implements this Hamiltonian. Then we have alpha is just some constant, P, V, K plus Q. So P, V is the projector on occupied states evaluated at point k plus q. So why do we have this object here? It's just to regularize the equation and avoid singularities. Minus epsilon vk. So epsilon vk is just the ground state quantum energy. So the band index v and point k. And then the, all this is applied to the uh, uh, this object delta psi v k plus q. This is the object that we want to compute, the response Quantum potential, and this all this is equal to minus 
PC K plus Q. So this is the projector in empty states. So C means conduction and V means valence. So this projector PC at K plus Q is implemented in the routine orthogonal eyes. And then we have delta V SCF. So this is the response potential, response SCF potential at Q point. And finally, all this multiplied, sorry, actually applied to the Psi VK, which is the ground state wave function. So this uh, application of this response potential delta VSCF to Psi is done by this routine apply underscore D pot. So apply uh, D, it means variation of potential, variation of the potential, delta, delta V, if you want. So this is the Steinheimer equation. In this equation, we need to know delta V SCF. It's written uh, below on the left. So this response potential, actually SCF potential, contains the delta V, the bare one, plus the heart rate potential shown here. Then finally, we have exchange correlation response potential. So dV exchange correlation over dN times delta N. So this potential delta V SCF needs as an input delta M, which is the response density. And this response density delta M is defined on the right as four times sum over K points, bands, then UVK complex conjugated, the ground state, lattice periodic component of the contrary function, multiplied by delta UVK plus Q, which is the response, response lattice periodic component of the contrary function. And this delta N, which is the response density, is computed by this routine uh, in CD rho SCF. It's quite confusing and long name, but this is the name of the routine that computes the response density. So here we highlighted uh, four, five routines, H psi, orthogonalized, applied potential, the routine that computes density, and also the Steinheimer equation is implemented in the routine solve uh, L inter, basically solve linear system. And so why do we need to solve Steinheimer equation? How is it connected to the dynamical matrix or interatomic force constants? So in the morning, in the lecture in the morning, you saw the connection, so we don't want to repeat it again, but essentially once you know delta psi, you can compute interatomic super constants and or, or dynamical matrix is the same object, but fully transformed. So if you want to know more on top of what you learned in the morning, we invite you to review this paper, review of modern physics or physical review B. So these are really key references where you can learn very consistently about all these equations. So that was a quick recap on the equations. Just it will be easier for you to follow the hands-on once we refresh in our mind the theory. So before I stop, I would like to show you this last slide, some, let's say, capabilities of the phonon code present. So the phonon code works for rather wide variety of systems and methods. So it can be applied to insulators, also polar insulators with Longitudinal optical transverse optical splitting, LOTO, that Pro Professor Janoff explained in the morning uh, earlier today. Also, it can be applied for metallic systems, but also magnetic systems, the scalar relativistic collinear level, uh, spinner B coupling also can be included. For this, we need fully relativistic pseudopotentials. Also, electric field calculations can be done to compute Born effective charges, Z star, and electric tensor that, again, Professor Gianotti described in the morning. Among most recent developments, there is phonon implementation for magnetic systems in a fully relativistic non-collinear approach, but also now we can compute phonons using uh, the DFT plus U approach. But there are many, many other features that are, are not uh, shown on the slide, like electron phonon, Raman, infrared, and other uh, features. Okay, so this was a quick uh, recap. I think now I, I can stop and Laura will guide you through the hands-on and show how the phonon code can be run on Leonardo using GPUs very efficiently. 
Uh, so let's start now with the first exercise about this uh, perovskite structure. In, in this case, we can, um, so please uh, go first of all inside this directory. Um, you should probably uh, update uh, by pulling uh, if uh, you pulled yesterday for the first time. So um, meanwhile, I explain you uh, a little bit uh, what you can find inside this directory. Please uh, start pulling to get the updates. Uh, so inside the two example PH, uh, you can find uh, uh, five uh, folders named uh, step, uh, which contain a readme uh, where you can find a recap of the uh, of what you, of the steps that you need to follow in order to do the exercise, a submit file which is the uh, job script that you need to modify and submit in order to um, compute the exercise to, to do the calculation on the compute node. You can find an inputs folder with the different uh, input of the exercise for phonon that we will see today. And um, finally, a solution where uh, um, the, the solution of the exercises is stored. So let's start uh, with uh, a little bit of explanation. So first of all, uh, in order to do a phonon simulation, uh, we need to implement a workflow. This workflow starts from a um, self-consistent run or a relaxation of PW self-consistent in order to compute the unperturbed wave functions. These quantities are stored inside the output directory. So if you want and are needed as an input for the phonon simulation. So if you want to do a phonon simulation, please don't quench IO because we basically need to store the data in the output directory and retrieve this information. So let's start by uh, doing this uh, relaxation of the perovskite structure with the PWC consistent. You should already be um, able to do this exercise because uh, you saw yesterday how to run a um, simulation with PWC consistent. Um, in this case, uh, you need to, first of all, enter step one folder and then copy the input with the prefix PW, where you can find the um, common, the typical name list, um, name list for PW with the some uh, parameters that are uh, void. You need to fill by, uh, in order to do a VC relaxation, and, uh, and in order to provide some information, for example, the name of the output directory and the prefix. Then, once you have uh, uh, filled the um, information in the input file, please have a look to the submit.job file and modify uh, some missing parameter in order to run the simulation on four GPUs. Then you can submit, and once the output, once the simulation is done, you can copy the output directory that is generating from PW into the folder named step two, so that uh, this output directory, which uh, uh, the, so that we copy the output directory, the um, ground state wave function uh, in the next step, and we can use this uh, for uh, the phonon simulation in the next step. So I'll give you uh, five minutes in order to do the exercise, which is uh, pretty simple. And then we can uh, move um, um, forward with the uh, actual phone simulation. OK, so let me just. Uh, if you have questions, uh, um, I'm not I don't see the chat right now, but uh, if it is, uh, I think you can open the mic and uh, ask directly or or uh, write on the chat. So here you can find step one. You can see the submit file that you need to fill. Keep in look that here there are some information that you need to specify. And then inside inputs, you will find the input file to copy and to fill. OK. Now, yesterday you cloned the directory. OK. 
you found uh, here the address so git clone this is what you did yesterday today we uh, pushed some new data so in order to get this new data you need to fetch it fetch and then you need to pull my case is already updated so it doesn't change but with these two instructions you should be able to retrieve the uh, changes to the exercises okay did you if you try to submit uh, this batch file and you didn't fetch and pull you might encounter an error related to the fact that your account is invalid and this is because there is this line missing so okay the line related to the account name Assuming you managed to do the step one exercise, if you didn't, uh, don't worry, the output directory is somewhere stored. Stored. You can find the output directory from PW here. Let me just go here in exercises folder, which should be available for all of you the 2ph solution you will find inside step one also the output directory this out okay but uh, if you did the exercise by your own you will have it inside step one so okay now we did the uh, pw cell consistent step okay and uh, at this point we want to compute the um, we want to use the phonon code in order to compute the phonon frequency at a given Q point. Um, the phonon code will initially compute for a generic Q point the unperturbed wave function, starting from the ground state wave function. Then it will compute the different contribution to the dynamical matrix and diagonalize it in order to compute the phonon frequencies. Keep in mind this step, which uh, 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 corresponds to the calculation of the perturbable function, is a non-self-consistent step uh, simulation that is inherited from PW and is actually done only if the Q point that we want to simulate is different from gamma, is different from zero. Okay, so in this exercise, we will do a simulation of, we will compute the phonon frequencies at Q equal to zero. So in this case, um, this step will not be done, but generically in a, um, uh, in a calculation of phonon frequencies at any Q point, at a given Q point, there is also this additional step, which is implemented by ph.x. Now, remember that the name of the executable now is no more pw.x, but since the step uh, ph.x. So, uh, how to do this phonon simulation? Let's go to step two. Now we need to uh, uh, use uh, another name list, the name list file for ph. So, Copy please the input ph.in um, inside the step two directory. You can open it and then we can have a look to the information that uh, are needed. So usually the minimum amount of information that you need in order to do uh, this uh, um, phonon frequency simulation is to specify the prefix, uh, which should be the same prefix that you defined inside the PW simulation. Uh, you, you can also specify the name of the file where you want to uh, print all the information related to the dynamical matrix. In this case, we call it Harmdin support. Uh, you can specify the atomic masses of the three uh, elements that are um, that define our structure, uh, and then we uh, we we need to specify the threshold uh, for the um, convergence of the phonon simulation, and finally the name of the output directory. This is important because um, 
of course, uh, um, we need to tell to the program where to find the ground state wave function. There are also other information that you can that you can uh, add to your input file. Please check, there is a link in the slides that will drive you to the, to the user guide where all the um, options that you can add to the input are defined, okay? So, okay, now we can uh, uh, do the second step. In this case, I invite you to submit the job uh, by using one MPI bind it to one GPU only uh, to do the exercise because we will use this as a reference to see how we can optimize uh, the performance by using more than one GPU. But uh, just to start, please submit the job and check it firstly so because there are some parameters to, 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 to add uh, and by hand, and, um, but let's submit it uh, to uh, one uh, GPU only. Okay, now I will go back to the chat. So only now I show you from the terminal. So here, okay, we are in the day two. Exercise phonon. Let's go to step two. Check that you have copied the, the output directory from step one. Modify the submit file. Sorry, I did it. Modify the submit file in order to uh, put uh, some missing information. Copy from uh, input directory the file ph.in. Remember to add the missing information and then submit. We are on track and we can uh, go on. With the, second, um, with the second step, actually, I can show you firstly the output. So once uh, you get the result, you can get uh, an output uh, like this. Okay, so here you can find uh, some information like uh, where the um, ground state wave function are red. Um, if GPU uh, acceleration, then the awareness is enabled. And then there is a recap about the um, structure of the system that you are simulating. Here, uh, if you check for number of K point, you can find the number of K point that is uh, that characterizes your structure. And uh, um, in this case, uh, in this particular kind of structure, we have a 20 K point. This is a number to remind for parallelization with pools, which are available in Phonon as well. And then uh, here you can see that uh, the system will uh, identify the sorry the, um, the program will identify uh, five irreducible representations to compute. These are independent contributions to the dynamical matrix that uh, will be uh, calculating one by one if you run the program on a single GPU. And you can see that for each representation, there is a self-consistent loop that is done up to convergence. Each, each one of these self-consistent calculations corresponds to a different execution of solve linter. Okay. After the calculation of these five different representations, there is a step of diagonalization of the dynamical matrix in order to compute the phonon frequencies. So the very first thing that we can observe, also if we have a look to the output of ARMDIN support file, which contains all the information related to the dynamical matrix. Let's go, sorry, to the end of this file, ARMDIN support. The first information that uh, uh, the first um, uh, this information is phonon frequencies uh, for a total of fifteen frequencies, as you can see. But uh, the first three frequencies 
which are the acoustic modes, are different from zero. So let me just okay. So in this case, we have to take into account that uh, uh, because of numeri numerical inaccuracies, the interatomic force constant uh, do not satisfy the acoustic sum rule. And so we have to impose this acoustic uh, sum rule with an additional program, which is provided when you compile phonon. This is called DIMMAT. And uh, in order to impo impose the acoustic sum rule, I get, uh, you know, and get uh, acoustic modes equal to zero. So, the, so actually, the full workflow of phonon, uh, in particular, um, includes a third step where you apply the acoustic sum rule by using the DIN-MAT program. This DIN-MAT program will add, will uh, fix, will correct the phonon frequencies for the acoustic mode in order to, um, in order to um, respect the acoustic sum rule. So this is the purpose of the third step of uh, these uh, phonon workflow exercises. And uh, inside step three, you can copy, you need to copy another input file, which is named din.in, and uh, modify this uh, din.in uh, with the proper information for the calculation, in particular, the minimum amount of information required are the name of the dynamical matrix, uh, the name of the file where you store the information of the dynamical matrix. We call that in the phonon simulation harmed in support. And then uh, you need to choose one of the possible uh, algorithm to apply the acoustic sum rule. So if you click on the link, that you can find on the slide here. You can open the um, user guide and uh, here there are more information regarding which kind of uh, acoustic sum rule you can impose. For example, today we can try the crystal and uh, additional parameters that you can add for your simulation. Okay, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. I So before, I forgot to mention that uh, when you submit, uh, the, so, the, sorry, that the, the PH input file requires also, of course, the coordinates of the Q point that uh, you are uh, simulating, okay? So in this case, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so... Let's do this third step. In order to implement the third step, you don't need to copy the output directory because the information are uh, extracted from the armdin support file, the file din uh, file, okay? And also this step, you can do it just by using one MPI task. Please remind to um, modify the name of the executable, which is now dinmat.x. And you can use this, uh, um, this graph as a reference. Okay, so I'll go back to the chat. First, the terminal. So now we are in step three. So what should I do is to open this, check and change the name of the executable here. Then Then I should copy the input and modify the input according to the name of file din and choose one SR, for example, crystal. This we call this first learning support. Okay. And then, of course, we need the Arndin file from the previous step, step two. No, okay, step two.
and then I can submit them. Okay. Once you apply the acoustic sum rule, you will find a new file. Let me go to the solution. Here you can find some new file uh, containing uh, um, the dynamical matrix uh, in different format, also for post-processing. And in particular, in dimmat.out, we can find the uh, corrected um, dynamical matrix. Okay? So, uh, this is, uh, but uh, up to now, we are running the code on a single GPU. So, now the purpose is to see how we can exploit uh, multiple GPUs to run the phonon code. So, um, regard, just a, a, a few words regarding uh, how uh, Phonon is ported on GPUs. Uh, the Phonon porting is a recent effort that has been uh, introduced in the releases or since the version 7.2. Most of the calling path for um, many uh, structures, in particular non-conserving pseudo-potentials, are nowadays GPU-enabled. And the approach adopted for, um, for, for to enable GPUs is... Uh, uh, the same adopted in PWC consistent. So we in the higher level part of the code, the main programming model adopted is OpenACC, while in the lower level part of the code that is uh, um, shared basically with the PWC consistent, um, there is still CUDA Fortran. So, uh, in particular, the offload of phonon has, uh, is based on the, as inherited, uh, the uh, offload of uh, PWC consistent and FFTXLib, which is called from the HC routine that are used to, um, uh, that are used in the SolveLinter um, solve um, steps. Um, Phonon, moreover, uh, shares uh, many uh, functions and many routines uh, with the ten independent density functional perturbation theory uh, inside the LRM modules. And, um, and now we can, for example, see, if you don't trust, also the output of a profiling session, um, which uh, shows uh, um, directly uh, where the code and uh, when the code is running on GPUs. Uh, to trace the application, uh, this is the simulation that we are doing today. To trace the application, I'm using uh, a tool called Inside System that is available on Leonardo. Here I open the real trace. And uh, here you can see, uh, in particular, what the code is doing at a given timestamp. So, in particular, you can see that uh, the main driver is called PHQSCF, and that this PHQSCF to compute the phonon frequency at a given Q point uh, does implements a number of solved linter step. Uh, here I cut the profiling session after two because of um, disk reasons, but uh, uh, in this simulation there should be five solved linter step. Each solved linter calls um, a, a number of Stenar Sternheimer kernel that are uh, that call if we zoom CG solve, which is based on HFC and which uh, uh, contains routines shared from PW. Um, as you can see, this is basically is the trace of the events of the routines that are computed that are encountered when the code is running. And here on top, you can see what is happening if kernels are running on the GPU. And as you can see from the profile, basically most of the simulation is enabled on GPUs. Okay, so... So if you want to uh, exploit, uh, the, um, if you want to parallelize uh, and use multiple GPUs in order uh, for, uh, for Phonon, uh, we can use uh, um, all the um, 
parallelization hierarchy that are available for PWC consistent. In particular, we can use uh, RNG, uh, real and grid, real, real space and reciprocal space distribution uh, in order to distribute memory. But keep in mind that this uh, parallelization level, as um, uh, Oscar said yesterday, um, requires uh, um, communications in order to implement a distributed Fourier transform and thus it can be, might be not the best, um, the most performant um, distribution um, technique uh, for when GPUs are enabled. Um, in Phonon there are also pools that are available, so uh, if you have uh, enough uh, degrees of freedom physically, you should uh, you should prioritize you could prioritize pools in order to scale on more GPUs. In this case, keep in mind that uh, each pool might compute more than one K point, and this depends on the kind of uh, system that you are simulating. The rule is that if you are doing a simulation at gamma point. Each pool computes one K point. If the system is non-collinear or magnetic, then um, each pool has two K point to compute. So the maximum number of pool that you can actually use is the number of K point divided by two. If the Q point that you're simulating is not gamma, then K unit, so then each pool will compute two K point. So the maximum number of k point, uh, sorry, of pools that you can use for your simulation is the number of k point divided by two, unless the system is non-collinear or magnetic, and then the maximum number of pools that you can use is the number of k point divided by four. So um, remind this rule uh, in order to know which is the maximum number of pool that you can use for your simulation according to the number of k-points that are available. In this case, for example, we have 20 k-points, and so we can use up to 20 pools because it's a simulation at gamma and the system is not, not collinear and not magnetic. Uh, Phonon have an additional uh, parallelization hierarchy, uh, which is images, and which is used to distribute independent calculation. In particular, for this kind of simulation, following frequencies at a given Q point, images can be used to distribute those irreducible representations. For uh, if uh, you use phonon for other kind of simulation, for example, for phonon dispersion, which is av available as well, you can use images to distribute instead the Q point. However, images distribute calculations which are independent. So in this case, if you, if, you, if you use images, you have very little MPI communication. Um, you can, in particular, I'd like to show you how much you can push a phonon simulation on an high-performance computing cluster like Leonardo. Um, this is uh, uh, one, uh, in particular, the comparison for the... Um, time to solution of the best configuration on Galileo Andri and Leonardo of a system that we recently benchmarked in the paper reported here. And this is not the system uh, used in this exercise, it's a bigger system. And uh, you can clearly see that using GPUs uh, gives a significant advantage in terms of time to solution. The blue columns are the time, sorry, Okay. The blue column are the time to solution on Galileo Andri, the violet column are the time to solution on Leonardo, and here the speed up is quite large from 10 to 6. Uh, in this case, I'm distributing the simulation up to 16 nodes, and I'm using pools to do this distribution. By combining pools and images, we can even push uh, the phonon simulation to an higher this phonon simulation uh, to an higher scale. Um, indeed, uh, here you can see that uh, I'm um, using for the first 16 nodes pools, so I'm distributing up this system, which has 128k point and uh, 192 irreducible representation. I'm, 
I'm um, distributing the, um, the, the, the code, the phone simulation, up to 16 nodes by using pools. And then from 16 nodes to 120,024 uh, uh, nodes of Leonardo, which is about one third, I'm using images. And as you can see, the efficiency uh, is quite sustained, up to one third of Leonardo. So, um, and basically this because pools and images have a, in, entail a little amount of communication. So if there are images and pools available, prioritize them in order to scale on multiple GPUs. So uh, let's see now how to activate uh, pools and images to, do, uh, to distribute our phone simulation on more than one GPU device. So this, uh, the step four uh, implements the same phono simulation, but now we will run the simulation on uh, two pools. So please, in step four, you need to uh, follow these, um, uh, these, uh, these steps. We need to copy uh, the input file. Now you can directly copy the input file from step two because we are doing exactly the same phone simulation and we already filled the input. Let me go here. So in step four, you can, I'm sorry, I'm in solution. Here you can copy the input of step two because we already filled this input so it is still fine we still need to copy the output the outer directory from step one uh, my case is in step two sorry from step one because uh, we need this output directory with all the information from the pwc consistent and then we need to modify here the submit file in order to ask to submit the job by using two pools. The code is still phono. And then remind to ask for the proper number of tasks and GPUs. Okay? Be careful because also these two parameters are missing. And then you can submit. Okay, now we are a little bit late, so I'll give you five minutes to do this. But okay, so regarding the main difference between pools and images, uh, I think this uh, okay, uh, pools basically distribute uh, K point, while images distribute irreducible representation. We can um, see now, I will, I'm going to talk about images now for the next exercise, but basically look at this, uh, if you want to have an idea, let's say a graphic idea. Uh, if you do the simulation on a single GPU, PW, PHQSCF is the driver of the phone. And the driver of the phone does solve linter, does one solve linter step for each irreducible representation. So in principle here, there should be five irreducible representation. If I distribute uh, this irreducible representation by using images, there will be each one GPU doing one solve linter equation. Okay, so um, the difference between the two is um, the the kind of calculation that I'm distributing among devices. With pools, I'm distributing calculation on different K points. With images, I'm distributing calculation on different, on different uh, irreducible representation. I think I have a picture of that, uh, that clarifies this in the slide. Here, let me anticipate this, this. So if you have irreducible represent, if you use images, basically each GPU will compute one or more of these. This is the next step. 
So in this case, we have 20k point, so we can distribute this 20k point between uh, two different rank and GPU devices. So each one will compute a subset, will do the calculation for a subset of 10k point. Now we need to move to the next exercise, step five. Okay, so in this case, we can uh, do the simulation. Oh, sorry. Let me just first show you. From the solution. What you will see from the output. So first of all, we can check the time to solution. So if you check the time to solution, now you see that the time is 3 minutes 15 seconds. And if we check the time for PHQSCF, sorry, this is repeated twice, and we compare this time with the time in step two, we can see now that uh, the main driver is taking not half of the time, but uh, a significant uh, reduction in terms of time. Okay, so, and this is because, uh, as I mentioned, now each process, uh, each pool is, uh, uh, so the, the calculation are distributing on two pools uh, instead of one. So now let's see how to use images. To use images, we can do this, uh, so when you use images, remind that uh, you have five representation that are independent, that uh, basically are used to compute independent calculation to the, to the, um, to the density, uh, to the um, dynamical matrix. And uh, if you use, uh, if you activate images and use, for example, four images, you will distribute each irreducible representation to one of the four rank or GPU devices. Okay. So, as uh, a thing to remind when you use images is that uh, with the image distribution, the last, st the, the last step corresponding to the diagonalization of the, dia dia of the dynamical matrix will not be done. And thus, you need to recover the simulation with an additional step uh, um, with an additional step and put inside the input file of the recover the option recover equal true. Okay, so let's see now inside step five. Uh, step five, uh, how to do the exercise. Sorry, I really did the exercise, but uh, you need firstly to copy the out file, output directory, with the ground state wave function from step one. Then you need to copy, uh, we can copy this already from step two, no? So, because we already did this step, inside the folder. Then we uh, need to modify the job file in order to run the simulation on four tasks per node, four GPUs, and then, uh, and then remind to change the number of images. In this case, we want to use four processes and four images. This is the first step of the simulation. We need a second step where we recover the simulation and finalize the calculation. To finalize the calculation, We need to add this line, recover equal true, to the input file. So actually, we use a second, we create a second input file. You can copy this from the inputs folder. Okay. 
Okay. You can copy this from the input folder. And then we can submit uh, the job in order to do the simulation distributed on images and then the last step for the diagonalization of the dynamical matrix. Okay, so uh, just to conclude now, uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, if we check the time of the output, for example, let's do tail out dot star underscore zero. You see that, uh, first of all, in, when you activate images, each image writes uh, its own log file. Okay, so you can also identify the time take by each image to do the simulation. Here we have uh, four images and five irreducible representation. We see that uh, clearly that there, are, there is one image, the third one, which is taking more time than the other. Why? Do you have an idea why the, the sorry the third image is taking more time than the other ones? So it computes a true irreducible representation. So of course the workload is unbalanced and thus it takes more time. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, um, this is just uh, a slide to show you uh, how performance can change if uh, you vary the number of pools, number of images, or if you use a hybrid pools and images. In this case, for example, you can see that uh, usually you can, go, you can achieve a good scalability with, uh, by using pools. When you use images, this is the time taken by the longest image. When you use images only, you need to keep in mind that the workload might be not balanced because, for example, the reducible representation have a different workload or um, you might have, like in this case, a more solve linter steps to be computed by more irreducible representation to be computed by one image. And um, in order to push further the efficiency, the, your simulation to larger scale with a higher efficiency, it might be an advantage to combine uh, pools and images. This is, for example, is the best, say, uh, <clears throat> time to solution that uh, uh, we could achieve with the 10 MPA task by using five uh, images and two pools. Of course, here you can push this simulation uh, up to, uh, in principle, 20 pools, but uh, 20, po 20 pools and five images. Okay, that's it. So just to recap, if you have images and pools available, prioritize them. Ensure that the workload is balanced, in particular when you use images. If RNG, yeah, RNG is available, but uh, if uh, um, try try to 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 maintain a good efficiency, try to minimize the use of RNG. Uh, and then, uh, if there is, uh, use a GPU aware. If if it is supported by the hardware, use a GPU aware version of the code. And uh, today we show just uh, how to compute foreign frequencies uh, for, a, uh, for a given Q point, in particular gamma, but there are more calculations that uh, you can do. Uh, you can find information inside this link and uh, here a brief list of other kind of simulation that you can achieve with phono. Okay, so now we can have the coffee break and I leave the floor to Tommaso. Go full screen. All right, so. Good morning, so my name is Tommaso Gorni, I work at Cineca, and now I will talk about how to run a spin and charge response calculation using the time-dependent density function of perturbation theory module of quantum espresso. So since uh, we are dealing with time-dependent density function perturbation theory in the linear response regime, this is why we have this P here, the, actually the uh, underlying uh, routine will be very similar to the phonon case, so we are actually calling the same routine basically, but we are actually uh, tackling a very uh, different uh, physical problem. That is uh, uh, the one of electronic excitations. So now you've seen how to compute 
uh, lattice excitations, the vibrations, actually phonons. And uh, now with time dependent statistics functional perturbation theory, we can compute electronic excitation, in particular uh, spin and charge neutral excitations. What are the interesting for uh, basically to, to interpret, uh, uh, interpret spectroscopies in elastic spectroscopies. Uh, typical case is where you shine, as Yuri told you before, you shine a material with uh, electron neutrons on, or, or phonons, you will excite the electrons in, of your material, and by measuring the uh, outcoming energy and momentum transfer of the outcoming electrons, neutron, or phonons, you can have different kinds of uh, spectroscopy uh, according to the excitation you produced in the interaction with your sample. Uh, these, uh, all these events can actually be uh, described by dynamical susceptibilities, that is uh, how your observable A reacts to an external field, phi. Uh, depending on what are A and phi, you have different susceptibilities and different properties you're measuring. So the phi will represent actually the, your perturbing uh, probe, and the A actually represents what kind of excitation you generated. So uh, here we'll, we will talk about uh, charge excitations, meaning that uh, normally you excite with a, a scalar potential your uh, sample and you measure how the charge reacts. And I will also show you about compute spin excitation. Uh, so you perturb with the magnetic field your system and you measure how the magnetization reacts. These quantities can be accessed uh, by time-dependent density function theory and in particular uh, in quantum espresso it can be computed with the turbo yields and turbo magnon code. So to show you what the equation uh, we use uh, look like, uh, these are actually very similar, maybe with a slightly different notation, but very similar to the phonon uh, Sternheimer equations. You see that you have your unperturbed Koneshaim Hamiltonian, the unperturbed Koneshaim eigenvalues. Uh, here you have more, the frequency. This is zero in the phonon case, here you have this frequency. Uh, these are the response orbital at a given frequency, and on the left uh, right hand side of the equation, you have actually the perturbing potential. So this uh, V prime xq omega is your external field with a given wave vector wave frequency that in the case of charge uh, excitations, for example, will be uh, um, a scalar potential with a given uh, uh, frequency and uh, momentum transfer. This V prime xg is uh, uh, how the exchange of correlation potential you use reacts to linear order to this potential. So these equations are identical to uh, the Sternheimer equation of the phonons with two differences, uh, also apart from the external perturbation, which in case, this case is, uh, is different. You also uh, have, you see that you have two equations because we have actually the response orbitals at plus omega and minus omega the resonant and the resonant response, which happens at finite frequencies. Um, and, um, and moreover, you have a, a frequency dependence, so you have to solve this equation for each uh, omega. Uh, this set of equations, the size of this set of equations, so is uh, two times the number of bands uh, times the number of k points. Here you see that uh, is n and k. Uh, so how you solve this equation? So first uh, uh, thing you can do is do exactly what you do for uh, phonons that is solve a this system directly, but uh, once for each frequency. So you have to invert uh, this system for each omega, find the phi prime of omega uh, for each omega, and once you have them, you can actually build the response density matrix. Uh, one, okay, once you have the response density matrix, uh, it can be shown easily that this is closely related to the susceptibility you are interested in. In this case, the uh, electron en energy loss uh, um, uh, spectroscopy cross section. Uh, the, uh, the, the, this approach actually so costs like a uh, say uh, phonon calculation times the number of frequencies you invert. This is why we actually uh, had, uh, uh, it was first implemented in quantum espresso another method, the one that Yuri showed you, that is the uh, uv langtos approach, where you take the system and you actually recast it as a large linear problem here where you uh, have an eigenvalue problem for uh, a Liouvillian operator, uh, which acts on a vector, on a particular representation of the response matrix uh, that we call batch representation, and is made of a uh, vector, which are the number of uh, uh, bands times the number of uh, uh, k-points. So you see this uh, a larger uh, representation of a larger set, but you have a linear problem. So once you have a linear problem, you can invert directly this problem and compute your rho prime, which will give you the response density matrix. 
This reformulation uh, is uh, actually can be advantageous because uh, normally we work with uh, in the ALDA uh, adiabatic approximation. That is, uh, uh, our exchange correlation potential do not have explicit frequency dependence, so we don't have an omega dependence on the Liouvillian, and which means that you can invert once and for, I mean you can actually uh, do a trick and represent this matrix once and for all for each frequency in a three diagonal form with a length of recursion. And perform the inversion afterwards when is for each frequency where it's much less expensive. So his, this is how the Langston's recursion look like in the case of the uh, turbo is case, that is charge susceptibility case. Uh, you each iteration you apply the Liouville operator to a batch, which is a set of uh, uh, orbitals, the number of band or set of orbitals in the number of number of band times number of k points. The application of the Liouvillian means nothing than applying actually the uh, cone shaman perturbed Newtonian and computing the uh, uh, exchange correlation potential with, with, with the orbitals. So it's the cost basically of a self consistent step, well, each application. And each iteration of this, uh, of this change gives you the beta and gamma coefficient, which form a it can be shown to be form, to form a three diagonal representation of your Liouvillian. So this is the bottleneck of the calculation, the hard part, performing this recursion. But at the end, you have your Liouvillian represented by this uh, coefficient. Once you have the coefficient, you can actually invert the three-diagonal matrix, which is very expensive. It can be, we will see it can be done serially, like on your uh, machine, uh, and, and gives you the um, response uh, uh, matrix for each frequency at the Q point you chose at the beginning of the calculation. So the advantage here is twofold. Once, uh, first of all, you invert. Uh, I mean, the hard part is is done only uh, once uh, and for all, uh, independent of the frequency. The other one, which uh, can be hand comes in handy, actually, is that uh, once you invert, uh, you know that in this uh, response function you have a pole for each excitation frequency. So normally you have uh, to regularize a bit this pole, and you put uh, a small imaginary part, which produces a Lorentzian broadening. And here, this uh, comes into play when you invert the system. So actually, you can try and experiment the different broadenings after the half part of the work is done. Whereas, for example, in, in, if you used a uh, sternheimer approach, you would have to uh, try uh, different broadenings uh, for the whole step consistent cycle. OK, so how is done in practice? Uh, the, the workflow actually is, is uh, a bit simpler than in the uh, following case, because you always start from the self-consistent calculation with PW to get the unperturbed wave function. Uh, after that, you run the turboys code, which uh, does nothing but the length of recursion here. So it, its output are the, the uh, coefficient of the three diagonal representation of the Liouvillian. And after that, uh, you use a post-processing code Turbo Spectrum.x that inverts the, the, the three diagonal system for the frequency you, you tell him and, uh, and gives you the, um, um, the uh, charge susceptibility uh, with which you can compute the cross section of uh, electron uh, energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, this uh, we provide, uh, I mean, Quantum Espresso provides uh, this, this script, but uh, this can actually be done also by a simple Python uh, script you can write on your own by simply parsing the, the output of the turbulent. Okay, so this is the idea. If you have no questions on, uh, on, uh, on the workflow or on what you're going to compute, uh, you can start and try yourself to run uh, this. Uh, is more an example than an exercise in the sense that we are running and commenting the output. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me get the terminal and be sure that everything is clear. And so I'm not seeing if there are questions in, in the chat. If there are questions relevant to this uh, uh, talk in the chat, please let me know. This seems to be old ones. Also. Here, okay, I don't see any. Okay, so let's start with the on. So first of all, uh, mm, be sure to do a git pull again. Okay, like this. You can enlarge a bit. Want. 
Okay, and uh, afterwards, so uh, since you run the funnel calculation, you have several uh, out directories uh, that can be actually quite uh, heavy. So uh, you can remove the one of the first step. Actually, you can remove them all, but uh, uh, please, uh, uh, if you go to day two, inside the exercise phonons, you have all your steps. Uh, uh, you will have a different out directory, for example, step one and you can remove them like so, okay, to make some space. If, if we are good on that, uh, I will go to the, okay. to the ease exercise. So there are no issues with that. If you already pulled uh, everything, and no, and no questions in the theory, Let's start with exercise. So you can go to uh, day two exercise eels, and you will see that you have uh, an input file and the script to submit with Slurm. Uh, the input file you find are PW, so ground state calculation, turbo eels, the length of calculation, and turbo spectrum, the post processing. To submit, uh, you can look at the submit script of PW is like the same of other ones you saw. We run with the four processor. Uh, we are using the CPU version. It's, this is bulk uh, silicon. So maybe you can comment uh, the input file. So this is standard self consistent calculation of bulk silicon. Um, and you see, we use uh, 12, 12, 12 K points. A cutoff of 20 readbacks. So I invite you to submit the calculation. It should be very fast. And this is just uh, to get the ground state wave functions. It should take seconds, actually. So let me know at this stage if you have issues with the graph state calculations. Generate this file, pw silicon.scf.out. If you go at the end, you see the job done. So I assume there are no, no issues with that. So we can look at how it's done actually. The turbo is input file, which is the one performing the Lanthus recursion. This is actually very simple because uh, all the parameters are read for the gnostic calculation. You only have to tell him what is the name of the gnostic calculation, the like prefix, and where it saved the, the, its output. In this case, it's temp here. Then you have some restart option. In this case, we are not doing any restart, so it's false. And the restart step 200 means to write the data necessary to restart every 200 length of iteration. These files, the restart files are very big because this is dumps to disk the batches, meaning all the, wave fun all the response wave functions. So I'll try to do it uh, less, less often as, than possible, depending on your case. But uh, normally, for this calculation, this kind of parameter is safe. The, um, the relevant part here for the, for, on the physics side is, is uh, under the name list LR control. So the like calculator Langtos, we are asking to use a Langtos algorithm. This is because actually we, uh, it was recently implemented by Oscar the possibility to use a Sternheimer approach to solve this, which in some case can be, can be used. So in the ELS calculation, you can also use a Sternheimer here. Here we use the, the traditional for the quantum espresso case Langtos algorithm. You set the number of Langstroth iteration to 2,000. So we will have 2,000 beta and gamma coefficients and the Q point uh, at which uh, of your external potential, the Q point at which you want to compute the, um, the response function uh, at all frequencies. This Q point, uh, beware that it's in two pi over a units Cartesian coordinate. So uh, not supported uh, crystal coordinate. So this is Cartesian coordinate, uh, two pi over a units. 
to submit the job batch submit turbo ills no, ills slurm so. so q1 q2 and q3 are the x y and z component of uh, the q point uh, like is the same in phonons so if you want to know the so if you want to know uh, at gamma for example which is not interesting in this case but it will be zero 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 uh, if you want to know the response at a specific point, you put the coordinates of that point in units of 2 pi over a. If you want to do a dispersion, you have to do yourself a path uh, with the Q, uh, and, and the run one calculation for each Q point along the path. Normally, when we run these calculations, you are interested that uh, the dispersion of uh, uh, your uh, of your excitations, we need that you look at the spectra for uh, uh, different Q points, how it changes. And so you know, by either experimentalist or other paper, you know uh, which direction you are interested in, in uh, computing the, 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 the charge dispersion, the charge uh, excitation. So I'm actually running the turbo calculations. Maybe you can watch it live. Okay, so you see this are the iteration going by. I asked 2000. So this is pretty fast. Normally this is a small system. Uh, we can see two things from here. Each iteration, we report the coefficients of the three diagonal representation. So you see that zero, uh, alpha is zero, the diagonal term. This is actually enforced by symmetry because here we use uh, um, at, um, a time reversal symmetry, uh, turbo is uh, do not treat magnetic systems. And you can show that this uh, actually implies that alpha is uh, always zero, so we impose alpha zero. And beta and gamma are actually are the same, also by symmetry. Uh, so what you actually compute is just uh, the beta coefficient, which is terms in your spectrum. And this z is uh, another important element, is, uh, what is related to the observables that you are looking at, the response you're looking at. Uh, let me go back to the slide. I didn't mention it, but Z is related to this U term here. So when you to compute the susceptibility, you can you can uh, you can show that uh, it depends on the external perturbation, which is V, and then on the servos you compute. In this case, the, the charge density, which is this U. So Z is the projection on, on the Langthorst eigenvectors uh, of uh, the charge uh, operator at every Langthorst step, which we, is necessary to compute uh, in the end the, the spectrum. Like if, okay, calculation is done. Okay, were you able to run this calculation? Is everything... Uh, Good. So if the calculation is done, you normally have everything you need to compute the spectrum. Uh, you just have to post-process the three diagonal matrix. So three diagonal matrix, by the way, is stored, I mean, the coefficients are stored uh, under the, your temp dir. You see that the code creates temp, temp, uh, temp eels. And inside you have all the wave function, all the files, and somewhere you also have the coefficient, which should be this uh, C is beta gamma z. If you open, uh, you have uh, all the coefficients, you know, not, not a friendly format, but uh, you see, these are actually your beta gamma coefficient, the alpha beta gamma coefficient and the z. So you can parse this file and the post process on your own if you want, but uh, otherwise uh, you have the script to do so. The script to do so is the Turbo Spectrum script, the input file of the script is the longest one for the shortest calculation. Uh, let me show it to you, Turbo Spectrum. So here you set, uh, of course, uh, as before, uh, the, the references of your, calcula of your calculations is equal to because this uh, post-process script actually is the post-processing script for all the time-dependent density functional theory codes. So uh, you have to tell him uh, we are post-processing his calculations. And here uh, you set uh, uh, the number of iteration you run. And also, this is the number of extrapolation, the iteration you want to extrapolate. To, uh, to understand the point of extrapolation, let me go back to the slides. 
So this is another way to increase to uh, actually uh, speed up the convergence of the spectrum. Here we are. Okay, so I have it here, so I can comment directly here the input. So why do we extrapolate? Uh, so normally. It is known that in this kind of calculation with the tur with the Langstroth algorithm, uh, the iteration, the beta coefficients, which determine your your spectrum, as a function of the Langstroth iteration, have this kind of behavior. So after a first equilibration time, you see that they, they tend to actually fluctuate around to constant values. Uh, why too? Because I in red I plotted the even iteration and in blue the odd iteration. So it is known that. Uh, after equilibration time, odd iteration fluctuates around some mean value, which is slightly different than the one of the odd value. Um, in this case, actually, you can extrapolate around the, for, uh, around the average of these fluctuations, and you can show that the spectrum you obtain is practically the same, if not the same. So to speed up convergence, you can, uh, you can compute with the turbo length, uh, your uh, coefficient up to a certain point, and then tell you to extrapolate. How you tell it to extrapolate? You put extrapolation os, and uh, you, you put in iter max the, the total number of the iteration you want to extrapolate. So here, you will compute the spec. In this case, with this setup, the spectrum will be computed using the 2000 real coefficient it computed, plus 8000 coefficient that are going to be extrapolated. The other parameter you have to tell are the frequency range you want to compute the spectrum with. So beware that start, increment, and end are the start, step, and end of your spectrum in electron volt in this case, whereas epsil is the Lorentzian broadening, which is in Rydberg for uh, actually due to some legacy of uh, and back compati compatibility we had to. Um, to uh, take care of in the code. So epsilon is in Rydberg, start, increment, and end is uh, electromode in this case. So we will compute the spectrum, we will invert the three diagonal system formed by 2000 beta coefficient plus 8000 extrapolated coefficient for each frequency from zero to 50 electron volt. okay? And this is done by the turbo spectrum code. So to so the spectrum code, you will see it run, uh, the script I provided is running serial, and you will see that actually, if you submit it, uh, takes no time. This is the spectrum. Once it starts running, it's a matter of seconds. Done. What it produced? It produced two files, which contain your prefix dot plot chi dot contain the uh, charge charge response function. This is chi on one. So you have the energy h bar omega from zero to 50 electron volts. See, as we asked. And here you have the real and imaginary part of your function. Uh, the um, absorption spectrum, meaning the electron energy loss spectrum, is related to the imaginary part of your response function. So you can trace it as a function of frequency. I can actually show it to you here because uh, this, in the references you can use this script to show. No, you cannot. But, but. Back to the point where we were, day two, exercise is. So here I plot minus the imaginary part of chi, and this gives you the user spectrum. And at the Q point you chose, so we chose 0 0.8600 to pi over a um, for bulk silicon. Uh, the spectrum with these parameters is more or less converged, I would say. You can try and play by actually uh, using uh, lowering the number of Langstroth uh, iterations, like 200, 400, to see how the uh, spectrum converges uh, uh, with respect to the number of Langstroth iterations. But in this case, uh, 2,000 iterations plus uh, uh, 8,000 extrapolation, uh, the spectrum uh, is uh, well converged. 
You also notice that you have another uh, file, which is actually the epsilon, the dielectric function, which is closely related to the um, charge charge susceptibility. If you are, in, but uh, the code provides you one over the, the inverse dielectric function and the dielectric function directly in uh, real imaginary parts. So you already have them if you need them. So for the ease workflow, that was it. I've got to check if there are any questions, more or less anywhere. And because uh, next, uh, I will uh, use the last uh, uh, 15 minutes to tell you about Magnum calculation, but the workflow is the same. So if you have any question, say, uh, you can ask them now, because uh, the, the workflow will be identical in the Magnum case. I will just uh, outline the few differences that there are in the equations, but uh, the idea will be identical. So I don't see any questions. No, no questions, okay. Okay. So to conclude with Turbo Eels, uh, what are the current features and limitation of the code? So it treats metals and insulator. It's not implemented for magnetic systems, but it, uh, you can include spin orbit coupling. So in the, uh, in the paramagnetic case, uh, both LGA and LGGA function implemented. There is also uh, some uh, work uh, importing DFT plus U uh, functionals, uh, supported both norm conserving and ultra soft theory potentials. And uh, about the computational part, uh, so yeah, the code makes use of uh, symmetry reduction for the K point for the blue line zone. Uh, you can parallelize over, uh, in, uh, over the Fourier transform grid and K point. And this code now, uh, since it relies on the same routines of phonons as Laura told you before, actually can be run on, G on, on GPUs. And this example run on CPUs only because they are too small to actually see some benefit. So for this silicon, uh, there was no point in running on GPUs, but uh, you can try and adapt uh, uh, this batch job to run the same example on GPUs and you see that the code will give you the same result, but not in a faster time because this example is too small. Okay, if there are no questions, I'll move on to the spin fluctuation case. Has anyone, was anyone able to run the example? At least the Langtos chain? No issues? Okay, okay. Yes, these are all examples, so we just have to submit a run, so normally there, there should be no big problems. Okay, so this is spin fluctuation. I will, uh, uh, to compute uh, uh, magnetic excitations in the same framework. Uh, so what changes? Well, changes the external perturbation, because now this V is uh, uh, not a scalar field, but it's an external magnetic field. And so it uh, also depends on the component, uh, X, Y, or Z, you are, uh, you are, you are uh, inserting in the direction of the field, actually, uh, you are using. And uh, also, since we are dealing with uh, uh, magnetic systems uh, and we want to include uh, spin orbit coupling, uh, we work directly in a non collinear framework. So these functions are now spin or wave functions, the response functions in the turbo magnum code. So you have uh, up and down components. This means uh, the rest is the same. Uh, you just have a, a, a slightly, uh, uh, you have to formalize a bit better uh, the anti resonant equation because first uh, you had the um, complex conjugate at minus the frequency. And uh, now you actually have to say that uh, this is not a complex conjugate, but it's the time reversed um, wave function. Uh, and uh, time reversal uh, uh, for scalar wave function is the complex conjugate operator. For spinner wave function, is more complicated, is, uh, well, I sigma y, the complex conjugate. And uh, you can show that the, this anti resonant equation needs, works on complex conjugate um, wave function and with the, a complex conjugate transformed operators. Uh, once you do this, uh, you actually have the same problem, uh, uh, Lewinian problem, as in the non-magnetic case, with the difference that you don't have time reversal, sim time reversal symmetry breaking, so you, you cannot uh, uh, impose symmetry, and your problem is slightly larger. So now you have 
that the, the size of this vector we act on is not only the, the number of orbitals, is actually twice as much because we cannot uh, use the time reversal symmetry operator. So the, the, the size of the, of, the, of, the, of the batch operators are number of key points, time number of bands, uh, times uh, the number of elements used to represent your individual orbitals, in this case plane waves, times two due to the reversal symmetry, times two due to the fact that you are dealing with spinors, so up and down components. The rest is identical to the charge susceptibility case. And so you can use the same technique. Again, we work with adiabatic kernel, so we don't have frequency dependence. Uh, the Langstroth recursion is similar, but in this case, again, no time reversal symmetry, so we have to retain the alpha coefficient. And so we actually compute all the three uh, rows of your three diagonal, all the three diagonals of your three diagonal matrix. Once you perform your Langstroth recursion, you have your three diagonal representation of the Uvillian. You can invert the system with Langstroth. Just be aware that now the magnetization susceptibility is a tensor because you have the response of the magnetization along the lambda direction to a magnetic field along the mu direction. So it's a three times three tensor. Since you can fix uh, uh, one length of chain as to fix the direction of the external perturbation, so you actually have to co you can compute one column of this matrix for with a length of recursion. If you needed the three the all the three times three tensor, you need three length of recursion. Once when you initialize uh, V along X, for example, one when you initialize magnetic field along Y, and the last one when you initialize along Z. Uh, normally, you don't need that many because for, uh, you are interested in transverse response. So if your system is uh, collinear, uh, the, 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 the interesting response happens in the orthogonal plane uh, to the polarization axis, so you can actually restrict the number of calculations, but this depends on your system. If you're unlucky, you have a non-collinear system with the non-collinear spin order, then you might need all the, all the tensor. But in principle, you can compute the whole tensor. So the workflow is the same, and we are going to do that, but uh, just to, to recap, you first run the uh, ground state calculation with the, to get the amplitude wave function. Then you run the length of recursion with the turbo magnum.x, which triagonalizes the Luvillian, this time for a given direction of the magnetic field. So you might need to repeat this step three times if you need all the, the full tensor. And then with turbo spectrum, you invert to obtain the sensitivity component. You find the exercise uh, under the, the folder exercise magnum. Same naming than in the other case. We compute uh, the excitation spectrum at a given Q point for bulk iron, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic iron. And let me just uh, show you the ground state uh, step because there are a few things to remark. So normal SSF calculation, just beware that uh, this code does not implement a symmetry reduction, so you will need to run the ground state code without any symmetry. This is the no sim, no inv equal true, which means that you're going to use the full grid, four times four times four. There is, this will be actually four times four times four, that is 64, I think, k points. So there will be no symmetry reductions. And uh, also you have to specify that uh, non-collinear is true because the, work, the code works only for non-collinear case. Spin orbit depends if you deem it important or not. In the case of iron, uh, it's not important, uh, it's not so relevant, so you can switch it off uh, and use normal pseudo potentials. It's a magnetic, uh, ferromagnetic system, so we start also the magnetization uh, to some non-zero value, and you will see that this converges to some uh, polarized state. So I invite you to go to the uh, exercise magnum directory, as I do, and to run the calculation because this takes a little more time. I think we're going to finish in time, but a little. Let's batch PW. So you know, I think there was a question, uh, why is the the grid out of gamma? Um, I don't know. No, it says that I think uh, I just made the example like so, but there was no real uh, um, reason why in the um, in the yields case of silicon so sometimes you need for uh, for convergence you might have a faster convergence with a shifted grid but uh, was not the case so 
Uh, I think uh, you, you can try and rerun the same calculation uh, with 0, 0, 0, and you should see the same identical spectrum. Okay, so the calculation is done. We just, if you notice in the end that you have a magnetic system, you know, run a, uh, a spin polarized calculation in the non-collinear framework. And so we have uh, the total magnetization as a vector for these points along Z. 2.5 bar magnetons, uh, this tells you if you run, uh, run uh, iron with the uh, LDA tells you that this, guy, this is not converged because you should obtain something around to 2.2 bar magnetons, but uh, we used a low cutoff because otherwise this would have taken too long. So this is still a reasonable thing. The result to, to just play with the code. Okay, so let's submit right away the magnum part. I'll, I'll explain you later on because this takes like uh, five minutes, I think. What is the magnon input containing? So the magnon input is uh, practically identical to the Hill's case. So our input is identical, really, just uh, practice out there and uh, restart options. Our control, so you see, uh, you don't have the calculator because uh, Sternheimer is not implemented in the magnon codes yet. We are just using uh, we have only length of approach for the moment. So you have to set the maximum number of iterations and uh, the Q point. Moreover, here we have two more options, which are pseudo-remission true, which uh, actually was used also in this case is the default. Uh, just to remark that uh, it, here it's important to use pseudo-remission algorithm. You get factor of two, which uh, for this slow calculation is a lot. And I pull two is actually the direction of the external magnetic field uh, I mean, yeah, so if you it's two, it's y, if it's three, it's z, if it's one, is x. So in this case, we are computing the column, the y column of the spin spin susceptibility. Let's just see if the code is running. Yes, yeah, so t minus f. So you see it takes a bit more time, but structure of iteration is the same. Here we have iteration uh, 1000 uh, something. Uh, so we have the alpha, you see that we compute it. So this is uh, more or less zero, but uh, so it should be actually more zero than this, but we are running with the local toss. So it's not perfectly converged, but uh, in this case, the alpha should be very close to zero, at least oscillating around zero. And we see the beta gamma coefficients are the same. We also have noticed that the gamma coefficient is imaginary. We have an imaginary part. Uh, so these are all complications due to the fact that we do not, do not have any more in the time reversal symmetry. Uh, this Z1, 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 there should be Z1, Z2, Z3, just to, to correct the sort of right. Uh, maybe Z1 equal 1, 2, 3. They are actually the projection of the magnetization uh, of the length of vectors on the magnetization at each iteration. So this is uh, M uh, projection over uh, Mx over MY and over MZ that will be used to compute the three components of the susceptibility tensor. Okay, so any issues with running this, uh, this calculation while it stops running? It's not. If there are no questions, uh, over the turbo magnon input, I will comment uh, on the turbo spectrum input to do the post processing. Also, here there are a few things to outline with respect to the ILS case. So, again, just tell the references of the calculation, the output the directory, with, and the, the name of the calculation. Then here, you have to set magnons true before we have to set yields true. Here is magnons true. Unit 3, which should be the default, which means that everything is milli electron volt. So this is why we were of the units, because uh, actually excitation uh, happen in different ranges. Uh, the charge excitation normally happen in the 
electron volt, if not tens of electron volt range, so it's natural to use electron volts units. Magnetic excitations are much, much lower in energy. So this is milliv units. So it's more natural to use milli electron volts. Uh, this is also why the, you will see the calculations are slower because we need a much higher resolution to run uh, uh, magnum calculations because you have to converge milli electron volts when you use the same cutoff to expand the wave function of tens of Rydbergs. So you have actually to have an incredible uh, high resolution. And this is why your iterations are normally much more, you notice, than in the ease case. Why in the ease case, it normally is uh, hundreds of iterations that makes you converge the spectrum. Here is thousand, is one order of magnitude more. Also, you can extrapolate, but here in this specific example, uh, it's not necessary to extrapolate. You can set this to 5,000. Uh, because uh, uh, another thing to mention is that extrapolations is important when you want to describe the particle whole continuum. You know that the time dependent, dependent density functional theory uh, actually uh, can uh, describe not only the collective excitations like plasma and magnus, but you also have all the uh, particle whole continuum. Um, if you are in a region of the spectrum where you have to converge the particle or continuum, uh, extrapolation is important. But uh, here in this specific example of the magnus, you will see that we have an isolated magnum peak out of the continuum, and so this uh, extrapolation actually is not, uh, is not needed. Here, again, epsilon start increment and end frequency grid is in milli electron volt in this case because unit is three. Check also the documentation. This is milli electron volt. Uh, IPOL2, we are just saying that we are, uh, are post-processing the spectrum for a magnetic field along the BY direction. Okay, calculation done, so we can submit the last one. Submit spectrum, and I can show you the spectrum. Since we are a bit late, I will cheat and show you the reference one. So this is uh, the spectrum, you see, is not much interesting, but because it's only one magnum peak. Actually, it can be super interesting because if you compute a different Q point, you will see the magnum peak moving. It will be the dispersion of your magnus. But uh, this spectrum is actually only one pole in your susceptibility. Uh, and this, uh, you can see that actually this width is the epsilon you put. So uh, it's not that you have several excitations accumulating here, it's just a single excitation. A, a, a magnum excitations that uh, have uh, the width that uh, is your regularization parameter, basically. So you can check that you obtain the same with the with your calculation. But I prefer to stop now and uh, uh, get questions on uh, everything I told you about, since we have uh, only two minutes. So if you have anything, any doubt, anything was not clear. Uh, or anything you didn't mention, let me know. While you think about it, I leave, I leave you the last slide saying what is the status of the code. So the magnum code can treat metals and insulators, allows for uh, include the spin orbit coupling effect if you want to. Support LDA functionals with uh, some work uh, with uh, implementing LDA plus U in progress. I mentioned that uh, GJ functions are, are not so interesting in the magnum, in magnum case because it's kind of known that it worsens the description of magnetic excitations, but um, probably we'll implement it, but uh, there is less uh, hurry if you want because uh, GJ seems to desc describe less accurately magnetic excitation than LDA. Uh, it works with the normal cost saving pseudo potential only. Remember to unset the symmetry in the ground state calculation because the code is not supporting symmetry reduction at the moment. But you can parallelize over uh, Fourier and K point. And in general, both for turbo yields and turbo magnums, parallelize as much as you can over K point. This is the suggestion because uh, it's much better. So when, um, when parallelizing, try to parallelize as much as you can over K points. With Magnum, it's a bit easier because we don't use a symmetry reduction, so you always have a lot of okay points. GPO floating is, in principle, doable. Uh, we are actually testing it, but uh, for the same reason I explained before, we leverage on the same routines and the phonon code, so uh, GPO floating actually works and it's going to be possible to use it very soon.